Yeah. Lovely. That's just natural, the natural throw. Yeah. Mm. It sound okay. Yeah, it sounds fine. Sick. Bro. Big surprise, big surprise. I need to comb my hair as well, Carl White, but I just. Uh, oh, I, I didn't even look at you when you were. Gonna, it's going to take too, to, too long, and I just can't <laughs> really get around to it. Yeah. It was because I had a broke ass mohawk someone did for me and she did it at an angle and it was <laughs> awful it was such a bad mohawk that i was like i'm gonna just because i've never had one before i'm gonna just have it for a, for a week or two and then i'm just gonna have to start from scratch but yeah i don't know i think i think i'm getting used to shaved head ellis i i appear more I like think, an egg i think it but... suits you to be honest i mean okay. it, it's so much easier to look after then this is, it's like, like your time of the shower is like halved it's great yeah and like you don't have to do anything to your hair you just like shampoo your scalp and then you you, you rub a towel over it boom you're done for the day is that thin it is thin but and like part of me doesn't like that his legs go back that far but <laughs> <laughs> that's so that he can kneel to suck disney's dick just imagine Ooh. standing like this like have you seen john boyega being just like a complete sass goblin when it comes to any interviews now or anybody talking about Star Wars. I, I have seen that. It's oh my funny. god, there's an yeah. IGN there's an IGN interview for Rise of I Skywalker and he's just like, he just does not give a single <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, what force power would you have? And he's like, none of them. I just not wrong there. <laughs> he's awesome, man. He's awesome. Hello. And he, he clearly like hired someone to make like a funny edit of him like kicking like internet comments. I saw like, that. Yeah, that I, was that. So I, funny. Yeah, I saw that. That's good. <laughs> He's the king. Um, we already started recording. I don't think we right. need a formal introduction. But um, you're listening or watching the the podcast time with the three mosquitoes. I'm a mosquito. Um, you are a blood. That. You are a blood sucking parasite, Carlos. Like, so yes. Very, <laughs> very excited vampires. about the prospect of that. Um. This is a podcast thing, I guess. And today we're talking about uh, some stuff, primarily The Last of Us Part 2, which has been a long yeah. time coming. That big boy game. It has. Okay. But before we uh, we jump straight into that, what have we all been consuming? Uh, I earlier had a Yakult. Uh, <laughs> <okay>. <laughs> your digestion's your digestive system is thanking you right now. It, it's it's it was very tasty. It was a light yakult, and I was interested because oh. I wanted to know the difference between a normal yakult and a light yakult. Was it just a plain? Okay. No. <laughs> yakult. It's it's yakult with slightly less of a sugary taste. All right. Okay. It's like diet yakult. Harry, it's have like... you got have you got your nerd mug to oh, show that you're a real gamer? Oh, I can. I've got um. These horrible drawings. Like, look at um, <laughs> like, like, look at wait, like, look at Bert Ward on that. Oh no! <laughs> oh, look at Robin. <laughs> Robin's so old. I should get I should get my Metal Gear Solid mug, and then I can be like, oh, what do you mean I'm not a gamer? <laughs> Excuse me, do you not see this? Um, I've mostly yeah, I've been playing a lot of Last of Us Two. Of course, you know, I played. I played a chunk of... I played the whole game in about three days. And <clears throat> I thought I paced it out quite well. Mm. And then I'm on my second playthrough at the moment. I haven't finished it. I've just got to... Uh, Abbey Day well, 2. Is. Yeah, well, we'll get to it. Um, put it in the header. Put it in the title. Yeah, everyone's going to know what this is. <laughs> um, yeah. But, like, yeah, I, I've, um, I'm already at 18 hours. And I haven't even got to... The like sex scene with Abby yet. Uh, All right. Um, so like, I think this playthrough is gonna take me a, like it's gonna end up clocking in a lot longer than. You just can't be playthrough. going for everything. Like, trying yeah, to get I'm, try I'm trying to get all the collectibles and like thoroughly just going through everything and see if there's anything I missed. Um, and there's actually been some quite significant things that I missed, which have shocked me because I thought I was really thorough the first time through. But mm -hmm. there's a lot of things like. I don't know, you'll move like a crate or something and you're like, oh, I've just moved that so I can get under. But really, you can also move that crate to another part of the room and then there's a uh, hidden like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or when you, ha especially when you have ropes, there's a lot of moments where it's like, there's a direct path of how you're meant to use that rope. 
but there's also like sometimes one or two other paths that you can do to get some extras or collectibles or something. Uh. So there's a lot that I've actually missed. Um, but it's good. It's good going back through. There's a lot of stuff I've been noticing as I go back through, but we'll talk about that when we get into The Last of Us. Um, I've also been playing Hotline Miami 1 again, just because seeing it pop up in Last of Us 2 on the PS Vita, it's <laughs> like, oh, I like Hotline Miami. And I was like, I want to play, Hot- play Hotline Miami. Um, and I've also been watching Normal People. Man. What, do you, what do you think of Normal People? I think it's very good. Have you seen it, Carlo? Yeah, I watched it all. We've, we, you have. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We've oh, all seen it. <laughs> oh, nice. Um, I thought it was to, you know, to not be a pretentious arsehole. I thought it was very human. It's very oh, yeah. soft and intimate <laughs> and nice, but also very sad and it's and like so it, horny and depressing. At the yeah, same it's, time. it's 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 the <laughs> horniest show I've seen in a while. Yeah. But it's also like every sex scene between the main two characters is so like tastefully done but also like it's really sweaty and like gross but also like perfect and like it also made me so uncomfortable at points with like how the characters treat themselves and let other people treat them Mm. um yeah i thought it was a very good show what did you think carlo uh ditto i thought it was very visceral very truthful uh i some of the moments they capture where they're just kind of led in bed afterwards Mm. those 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 were perfect and those moments that you don't necessarily see in television yeah. quite often. Um, Bruford graduate, shout out, loved her. Great, Neve Lim- Lin- Lynch, I think that's her name. Who does she uh, play? She plays the red haired uh, girl at the school in the first three episodes. Oh, okay. Oh. So, someone the same school as you? Yeah, she graduated the year before I got there. So she's oh, cool. <laughs> you're gonna be you're gonna be in normal people too, electric blue. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the plan. That's the plan. I've got, I've got my Irish accent down. You see. Have you? I, no, I think I think it's interesting don't, don't that you even ask me. Well, why would you bring that up, Carla, if you didn't want to display it? <laughs> <laughs> I take it back. I take it back. I'm sorry, I think Alice. It... In the history of like accents and stuff, I can never do an Irish accent. Like I can sort of attempt like other ones, but whenever I do Irish, it's just like it becomes Jamaican. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've I've kind of found because I've got two um, Irish guys in my year, but they've got mm. slightly different accents. I feel like I now have to honour the location of the accent in Ireland. I mean, you have to do that oh, everywhere, no. but like <laughs> I can start to hear the differences between the two. It's weird. So much more complicated. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> But yeah, Normal People is a good show. Uh, Great show. Last night they aired in Ireland some, like, I think it's, I think they're basically one or two skits. Basically, they're like comic relief skits with the cast of Normal People based like 40 years after the show. Oh, really? But they sort of build it in like news articles as like, oh, there's two more episodes coming where they're 40 years older. And I was like, oh, that could be interesting. But there's more just like a comic relief thing. So we'll see when it comes when it when it gets to the UK or goes on YouTube or something. But as of right now, it sort of just looks like it's a funny thing for comic relief because obviously yeah. it was a big show in Ireland. Um, but yeah, I also just really think that the way they end and start each episode um, varies quite a lot, and is also quite like I just really like the. It's a weird thing to point out. I just really like the font of Normal People as the title, <laughs> yeah. and like and like how they. I don't know how they put it against backgrounds, how they use it to like punctuate moments and how, especially how they end some of the episodes. It really, really, I don't know. It feels like a really long arching narrative and I can't imagine waiting a week between those episodes. No, I, 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 um, um, Cause I think they just released all 12 episodes at once on BBC iPlayer. Right. Okay. Which is what I think they did. So you don't have to wait, which is good. Yeah. But yeah. Cause like, so I think it's episode five. Where it starts off and it's playing that Carly Rae Jepsen song. It's like oh, both yeah. together. Which, and it's also has like I think it has like a title drop like a few seconds in. It's just like so sweet and nice. Mm. Yeah. Good bit. It's a good show. Good music as well. It's got a really good soundtrack. It's got a very good soundtrack. Yeah. I've had that on the background in a lot of like constantly since it came out. Just for I, study and stuff. It's I, really nice. I was shazamming like most of the songs during the series, and now like my last like. My most recent 10 saved songs on Spotify are all from normal people. But um, I think it's, I think it was a very good piece of television and yeah. I'm interested in reading the book as well to see if it deviates at all. But yeah, the two main cast are fantastic and they have really good chemistry. And obviously not to dwell on normal people as a TV show too much because we've heard to talk about other things, but 
Um, I think Connell as a character is really interesting, how he's like very in touch with his emotions, but also completely inarticulate about how to express himself in any shape or form. Like he has no idea how to like say what he wants or do anything. And it takes, and it's so much miscommunication that could have solved so much heartbreak and like all this other stuff. Yeah. The last part, sort of the hardest bits to watch. <laughs> it's so good. Yeah. But yeah, but I think they're working on a TV series of the writer's first book now. Yeah, okay. conversations with yeah. Um... strangers or something. Yeah. But we'll see we'll see how it goes. I'm I'm interested. I think those two are gonna go quite far as actors. They seem to be getting a lot a lot of press yeah. and a lot of you know online attention. Um but I've been consuming that and I've been consuming Last of Us Two and Hotline Miami. And that's pretty much my life at the moment. Carly, like, apart from a yakult, what have you been consuming? I had some burgers earlier. Was, no. <laughs> um, what have I been consuming? I mean, I've been I've been educating myself a fair bit off the back of the Black Lives Matter movement. So I watched mm. um, When They See Us, which I thought was brilliant. That's I, a really good. That's, that's so good. It was a hard watch. I think yeah. it's the most I've ever felt watching a piece of television because, like, the first episode, you're so angry and there's filled with rage. It's awful. By the end, you're like sadness, a desolate sort of feeling. Um, yeah, I thought that was brilliant. Def- definitely go and watch that. Um, I was pl- I'm playing Death th- through Death Stand, Death, 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 <laughs> Death Stranding. Oh, nice. Uh, I'm, I, I guess I'm about a quarter of the way through that. But well, that how far are you? Um, I'm just in the middle of episode three, I believe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Episode like, three not... is really long. Yeah, okay. But, it's good. Yeah, but also, Carly, like, there's like 15, 16 chapters. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I realise this. And I, um, Miles played a little bit ahead of me. Apparently, I'm about to go into the snowy area. Right. I don't know. But yeah, so that, that, that's it, it, an that, interesting one. Death Stranding is an interesting game because... It's actually just sort of one big open world, but the way it like makes everything still feel fresh for that long amount of time, mm. and it changes up your traversal and stuff is quite interesting. But by the end of Death Stranding, I was like an emotional mess, and I didn't really understand why. Yeah, yeah. especially the last few bits. Yeah, yeah. but yeah, it's good. I mean, it's, I hope I hope you do actually get on and finish it. I will do. I, I've been nagged by a friend to finish on Bioshock Infinite as well, uh, which right. I haven't got, haven't ever got round to. So I've got that on my plate as well. Um, in terms of other things, whatever I I've started watching 30. I've been watching a lot of documentaries as well, like 13th. Uh, oh, that's Jeff, good, dog. Uh, yeah, that's that's, good it dog. seems I'm only about halfway through, but it seems interesting. Um, the, the Jeffrey Epstein documentary, yeah, that was kind of like it's kind of the most standard Netflix documentary. It's like so generic and like its presentation, like form and everything, yeah. But like yeah, it's yeah. kind of okay. I watched it all in like one night. They need to get Michael Moore on a Jeffrey Epstein documentary, <laughs> and he just goes up to put prison guards and he's like, I know what you did, I know what you did, I know what you did. <laughs> Let's get Bernard Herzog in it as well. <laughs> <laughs> he just leaves, he just leaves a picture of Jeffrey Epstein in a prison guard's like pocket and walks away. I'm <laughs> Harry, what have you been consuming? Um, not too, not too much um, different. I've been watching a lot of the What We Do in the Shadows TV show. Oh yeah, and that's like I think it's probably better than the film. It's like wow. really, it's like really, like really funny. It's like each, it's like because it's because it's only like twenty minute episodes, and they're like eight a season or ten or something. Um, it's just so short and nice and watchable, and like Matt, and also Matt Berry is one of the main vampires in it, mm. and he's always like hilarious and everything. And I think it's also like, it's also just like, well, I think like all the like because it's because it's segmented into ten, however, ten or so many episodes. It's got like a lot more going on as well than the film because the film is like doesn't go much beyond vampires funny, like just vampires funny. That's it. I feel like the show like it brings up like. It brings up like themes of like being like like otherness and feeling different, and like lots of um, like quite a lot of stuff, and like um just just like how like even if you're different like still kind of like even if like you're a, you're a vampire or something like it's still kind of like um I don't know like it's a good show just watch it. <laughs> it's a really good show. It was weird because I, I actually re- I actually rewatched the film last week and I was like oh I should check out the TV show at some point. Good show. Yeah. yeah. What else have you been consuming? 
um, been playing at Akani, and that's really fun. But like, it's like like in terms of like the um, game progression and like how the game like plays out moment to moment, it's basically just a Zelda game. Mm. So like, but, but, but like with Japanese art style on your wolf and whatnot. But that's um a lot of fun. And besides that, Last of Us Two, not too much. <laughs> but yeah, good. Yeah. I, I, yeah, it was funny. I was breaking up my playtime as Last of Us 2 with normal people, and it wasn't exactly an escape from, like, depression. <laughs> that's, that's not, that's not a it was just like, breaker. it was just like, oh, I'm sad about that. Okay, I'll go watch this show about horny teenagers. Oh, now I'm sad. Okay, I'll go, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was, it, it was a good thing. Um, so quick news that's relevant to our conversation today. As of like yesterday or today, Sony announced that Last of Us Part Two is the fastest selling PS4 exclusive of all time. Yeah, um, beating out beating out Spider Man. So it sold four million copies in three days, which is quite a lot. A um, yeah, I I don't I at this point I don't know what Sony are gonna like. Uh, I mean, Sony are just gonna give Naughty Dog as much money as they fucking want. Yeah. They're just gonna do, let them do whatever the fuck they want, and like, just like, oh, you need seven more years and you know a billion dollars a but it's okay, just take it. It's cool. It's cool. We're fine. But um, yeah, it's 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 big. I uh, we'll talk at the end about what we think Naughty Dog are gonna do next, but. I really hope they will just have a small break. Yeah, I'd, I'd like for them. I'd like for them to make like a um like a racing game or something. Just like chill yeah. out, make like a, make like make like a Mario Kart game with all the Naughty Dog characters, I like mean, the Uncharted they, and Last of Us and stuff. Because they made Crash Team Racing like twenty years ago. Yeah, so they can still do it. I yeah. think if they could get the rights from Activision and they could put Crash characters, Jack characters, Uncharted characters, and Last of Us characters, I'd totally play that. And the thing that I'd also want is I want Abby to be a, every character has to have their own ultimate move, and Abby's ultimate move needs to be a golf club that whacks the person out of the front of them, <laughs> just knocks them out. That'd be perfect. Oh. It'd be perfect. I just want to see Ellie and Joel smile again, you know. But, um... <laughs> anyway, let's uh, let's get down into the Last of Us Part Two. Um, so full disclaimer, if you hadn't guessed right now, we we ain't we ain't skimping on those spoilers. Um, we're gonna talk about the entire story from beginning to end and go into detail with events. So if you haven't played the game, don't watch this. And even if you think you're not gonna play the game and you've decided you just wanna spoil it for yourself, I suggest you also don't watch this. Just play the fucking game. Um, and if you can't afford it, just wait. Because it's really worth it as an experience. And I think you can't really replicate how this thing makes you feel just by watching someone speed run it on Twitch, um, yeah. which was a lot of people's first viewing of it was this guy who did a 17 hour stream of the whole game and like skipped cutscenes and stuff so that everyone could just say, oh, it's shit, it's shit, it's shit. It's a very different experience when you just take your time and you're personally playing through and you have attachments to stuff. Just Take your time. And also, I have a fucking issue with people like Angry Joe who will moan about this game and moan about a ton of other games and talk about, like, it's shit, because they go in hating it, but also play the entire game, sat around with three other dudes, like, with the game on low volume and just, like, <laughs> complaining about everything, drinking beer and eating Doritos while you play it. That is not how this game is meant to be played. Like, play your games how you enjoy them. But like talking shit and joking about Dragon Ball Z while you play this game with your best mates is not going to give you the best experience regardless of what the game is. You know what I mean? Yeah. So just be careful who you're listening to. I think there's some really good reviews out there. But even if you think you're going to spoil this for yourself right now and you decide you hate the game, please just try and give it a go. Because I wasn't sure how I was going to feel about this game before playing it. And I'm so glad I didn't just like... I don't know, decide I wasn't going to play it. I was never going to do that because yeah. I'm me. But like, <laughs> yes. So going into this game, um, we'll just sort of talk. What were your expectations of what this story was going to be, Carlo? My expectations? I mean, I knew it was going to be fucking great because Naughty Dog haven't made a bad game yet. Um, I... 
I, I, I expected them to play with my expectations, which is meta in itself, but like, Like, I expected them to do something that I wouldn't expect. Um, just trying to be like, you know what, I'll take everything on board. Let's see what, what, you, what you've got for me. Um, and I knew that because Naughty Dog are who they are, they would have done everything for a reason. So I, I kind of knew that there was um, all these leaks and what have you, and people weren't happy about it. I'd avoided them like nobody's business. But there was always going to be a reason for them doing what they did with the game. I didn't figure it out. So, yeah, went in with, with, with blank eyes. And I think it's interesting as well, because looking back, I remember Neil Druckmann saying that um, don't worry about the trailers and stuff spoiling you on anything. Those sections and trailers and everything have been specially curated for a reason. Um, mm -hmm. And playing it now, you can totally see what they meant, as yeah. in like some of those yeah. cutscenes and stuff and trailers were just false. They were just lies. That's great. <laughs> I, That's great. That's I, I, I really have no problem with that at all because it meant that even though we've been waiting for this for several years, it was just like I still, even going into the game, I was shocked. Even though I'd seen the leaks, I was yeah. still shocked at what this actual story was. And for some reason, I was still convinced that this story was going to be a revenge story on Dina. And I think that's what the game was trying to imply or what they're trying to imply in their marketing yeah because um mm. yeah because they shut off those gameplay videos before launch and it shows a bit where you go through seattle with dina yeah. but they and dina's not him. there she's not there yeah so all of the pre-release gameplay was carefully curated so people wouldn't know whether dina was part of the game or not and um it wasn't until i played it and that it all sort of made sense and um yeah, Harry, what were your sort of expectations going into it? Because I know you weren't planning on playing it this soon yourself. But... Yeah, because um, I was planning on waiting a bit to for it to go down, but I just thought I'd just play it and get out of the way. <laughs> but um, which I'm happy I did. Um, but you know, because 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 I'd seen most of the leaks. What what leaks had you seen? Because I'm curious now because we All haven't right. actually spoken about it because we were just right. like half speaking because I didn't know what you had seen. <laughs> I didn't know what I had seen that you had it, and I was like, yeah. I don't want. Yeah. So what had you um, actually seen? You saw an Instagram so post. Well, I saw an Instagram post, basically had them all compiled, and also like the full um, plot summary thing, which didn't turn out to be true. So I saw that like, so I saw um, Joel's dead body and Abby standing over with the golf club. I saw Joel's grave. I saw, um, um, and I think I, I think it's basically those two bits, and also the whole stuff about like you play a good chunk of the game with Abby. Yeah. And then, and I also saw like a full plot summary. That didn't turn out to be true. What it was, was about, the plot like, summary? I think it was like um, I think it was about I, I, I think in the plot summary Abby kills Ali. I oh, think right. that was it. Okay. But, um, so yeah, it was quite so like although like I knew that Joel was going to die in the game going into it like because of its place in the story and it's still like a very emotional thing like it still yeah like it still caught me off guard and like going into the game I I um. I played the first game again and left behind like immediately before. So I finished the first game, then like twelve hours later, I was playing the second. And um, because of that, I was kind of like, because like, I was still in the same mindset, like theme and tone of the, like, um, of the first one, and like and what all the characters were. And I think going in, I was, um, I think going in, I was kind of expecting something a bit more basic because the first game, the first game is really good, but I don't think it's like a, a story that has that many like that much going on necessarily. Mm. It just tells us like one story and like probably like one of the best possible ways to tell that story. I, I think it does it very effectively. Yeah, but. I think that's what sets Last of Us 1 apart from this game and in some ways Uncharted 4 is I actually think Uncharted 4 isn't necessarily a, a unique game either <laughs> in its narrative. Like it, it's not, not something we haven't completely seen before. And Last of Us 1 is not is something we've seen before in other mediums as well. But it is just the execution of it and how it's handled all the way through that sort of made it become this, you know, special thing. And it was weird that I, I was so, so, so excited for this game. And yet I'm not really that big a fan of the first game. Like, I think it's a, I'm really not. I think it's a very good game. And I put it in like my top 10 of all time. But I'm not like obsessed with it and I don't think it's perfect and like going back with it I have a lot of issues with it and so I don't know why I was so excited for this considering I wasn't just like the biggest fan of in the world like if it was Metal Gear or something else it'd be completely different 
but with this I think it was just I was seeing the potential in the trailers of what this could turn out to be and I was just like that just sounds so interesting and like yeah. applying that to what the foundation of the first last of us is I just can't wait to see how this plays out but um yeah, even even until I was starting to play it, I was still expecting Dima to die early on, and then you'd have a bit of a journey with Joel, and then somewhere along the line he'd die, and then you know the, and thinking about where my brain was before I played the game, and like how that story actually pans out, it's completely different. Um, and I saw some leaks a while back saying that Abby was like Ellie's mum in like a different timeline, and like all this other stuff, and I was like, okay, that's a bit weird. Um, and then it was like someone was like, "Oh, here's the confirmed plot: the Seraphites kill Elian, uh, kill Dina because they're homophobic, and it's like a big thing, a bit against religion." And I was like, "Okay," which it totally wasn't. <laughs> and people just love to make up bullshit. And also, mm -hmm. supposedly, the ending was leaked online. The ending being Joel being killed, which wasn't the ending at all. But everyone was like, "This is how the game ends. It's shit. It's bad. Whatever." Anyway, you put the game in, you put your two discs in and install the game of all 99 gigabytes of it. It's 77. Oh, 77 for you? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Yeah, it was about that, yeah. My information bar says 99 gigabytes. That's odd. It's <laughs> lying to you. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, you, I sort of forgot that it was two discs. And then at that point, I was reminded of like the only other game that's been to this was Red Dead Redemption 2. Mm. And I was like, so this is a game that has the same amount of work, supposedly, as Red Dead Redemption 2, except it's a 20 to 30 hour linear narrative experience. Um, you know, linear isn't the right word, but we'll talk about that in a minute. But it, it opens up with you uh, in control of Joel once again for the final time in the series. Yeah, supposedly, and he's sort of telling Tommy about what he did with the fireflies and the fact of what he's done. And it was from this moment that I realised that this was going to be a sort of impressive feat in terms of acting, because you get so much information from Tommy's reaction to what Joel says mm -hmm. that you're like, mm -hmm. oh boy, and Tommy's just like processing all of it. <laughs> and he's basically wanting to say like, you're a fucking psychopath. But also, like, I completely understand that he's just like, that's a lot. Yeah. Um, but I thought it was the perfect sort of opening to sort of transition between <laughs> and playing as Joel and Tommy. And it, ba I mean, it basically continues like maybe a few hours after the ending of the first game, um, maybe a day. I think maybe like a month, I think. Maybe. Uh, yeah, I was going to say a, li a little bit more time, I think. Yeah, there's okay. a yeah. distance between the actions and Joel speaking about it, I think. Yeah. But yeah, it starts with him cleaning up this guitar for Ellie, which has a moth on it, let's remember. Um, yeah. And he goes down into Jackson with Tommy. Tommy's like, I ain't gonna tell no one. And then the game starts. And you go mm. in with Ellie. And it was also another moment of... Because a, a, a lot of people seem to have a problem with this game is that I think it's really pulling at straws when they bring this up, this argument. It's like, it's like I need something to complain about, so this is why I don't like it. People are talking about how um, it doesn't make sense for Joel to be so trusting towards Abby and so be such a nice person and like tell her his name. Like that's not, Joel, Joel is a smuggler. He's so wary of everything, but it's like, <laughs> even at the end of Last of Us 1, you start to see him being a dad again. Like you start yeah. seeing him be warmer to he cares for people. Yeah. Like he genuinely cares for people. I mean, that's the whole point of the yeah. first game is that he he learns his he gets his humanity back and he starts to let people in again, which he hasn't done for 20 years. Mm -hmm. Um so this game starts and you have this beautiful sort of father father-daughter interaction of like him telling her a stupid joke and like playing the guitar for her. Um and I I I really, really love that they put a guitar mechanic into this game and mm. they made it something that you interact with as a player. And also what's impressive is later on when you can practice guitar, there's a full guitar with all the chords mm -hmm. that is perfectly allocated to the way you touch on the touchpad and you can play a full guitar in the game. That's insane. <laughs> 
That is a crazy amount of work. That was someone's job for seven years, I bet you. <laughs> and it was just like, it's just such a small part of the game, but that's, in, that's incredible. But it's so unnecessary. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I really love that you, you, uh, you start off playing uh, the guitar for Ellie. And you can sort of tell that she didn't necessarily maybe believe him at the end of the last game. And he said, you know, that he was telling the truth to her. And yeah. you can sort of see it. She's, she's kind of closed off to him and she's kind of not being receptive to him. And then he sort of opens up to her by playing this song. And obviously it's just him playing a song. But I think it's him also saying a lot more about, which, which is sort of the message of the game, which is about, you know, if, if, if I were to lose you, I'd lose myself. Yeah. Which is him, which is also Joel sort of, to me, ju justifying his actions of the first game a little bit. Um, and then, of course, that song, I think it's by Pearl Jam. Pearl Jam, yeah. Yeah, Future Days, um, becomes like this massive story beat for basically the entire game. It becomes this massive connection between Ellie and Joel. Um, how, what did you guys think of this sort of opening section when you were playing, you know, playing guitar and seeing Ellie and Joel back together again? It was, it was it's kind of like, um, it's just so sweet and nice. And it's also, um, I know, because I feel like, because it shows like, their first, like because it was the first time you see like their father-daughter dynamic in like seven years. Yeah. And I feel like, um, I feel like it really delivers on that in terms of like that, the, the, that core cool part of the first game. It feels like it, <clears throat> it continues that like immediately mm. as soon as the game begins. And I think it really, I think it sets mm. up like most, like a good chunk of the themes in the game really early on in an effective way. I liked it a lot. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, I, 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 when I saw the, that scene, I got all of that as well, well. I got their relationship from the first game being echoed. But equally, I saw kind of damage going on underneath, and I, I could tell from, right from the off that sure, this they, they've gone through this this ordeal and they've come mm. out being bonded as as father daughter sort of thing. But that's not the reality of those relationships. There's still mm. more to it that ha that happened between the end of the last game and now, um, and that damage is starting to seep through. Um, so I was on edge for their relationship mm. from the off from the offset. I think. I think most of it for me was just seeing distrust in Ellie and just sort of not showing how mm. she feels about Joel now. And then when he sings to her, I think she loosens up a bit. And, and it is that act, that symbolic like passing of the guitar to her and that, that skill of playing the guitar, which is like his main gift to her in this game. Um, and their connection based on that. Um, but I, th I think I was crying during the opening. Or I was tearing up just seeing them together again and also just having the realization of oh my god this is the last of us mm -hmm. and like it felt so consistent and faithful to the characters mm -hmm. in the first game and it was also seeing joel as a dad and seeing him be how he was with sarah all those years ago and be joking with her and be warm with her and it was like whoa I Wow, because we got a little bit of it in, in the first game, but now it was like on a different scale. Um, and then obviously four years pass, and that's four years of Joel being a dad, Ellie growing up and having love and relationships and heartbreak um, and deciding to chemically burn her bite mark and cover it with the tattoo of the moth that's on the guitar. Um, you get to play a little bit of the game, see her and Dina bond him. They have a little bit of the old, the old lesbian sex in a, a weed bit. in a weed greenhouse, a very tender moment. And then suddenly, I'm playing as this bitch called Abby. Who could she be? <laughs> and I was like, What's occurring? <laughs> I, I, yeah, I think I missed the line the first time, where Owen is saying to her, "He's down there somewhere." I didn't, I didn't catch that the first time through playing, so I wasn't sure why they were in Jackson or whether they were just planning to mm. attack it for supplies or whatever. Mm. And then you start playing as her and going through it, and I knew that she would eventually kill Joel, but in my head this wasn't going to happen until very far in the game. Mm. And you're playing through, and she's kind of muscle... She's a, she's a muscly bitch. She's got big muscles, yeah. And I think, I think at first I was like, oh, this is a really cool way of doing a tutorial. Then I was like, 
they've put way too much effort into these animations for this character to just be a tutorial. <laughs> um, so you're playing through this, and then uh, Jesse, who's also a great character in this game, comes to Ellie and Dina and is like, Joel and Tommy never turned up for their, for their patrol. So everyone's panicking. Then you go back to Abby, and then suddenly, boom, Joel shows up. Yeah. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> this is weird. I was like, okay. Yeah, I caught we... me off guard a lot. <laughs> I was like, are we going to be like, is she going to be pretend to be Joel's companion the whole game? And then towards the end, they're going to fall out. What's going to happen? Um, so you go through that whole sequence and she's like, oh, we can go back to my, to my house, which also for the people who disagree, does make sense for a character moment because there's like a hundred fucking infected outside. They need to get out of there. And they're like, okay, we'll just go somewhere. So they go back to this house. And as soon as Joel says his name, you're like, oh dear. Oh no. Oh no. Oh, oh no. dear. And as soon as she pulls the trigger on that shotgun, my it? hand was over my mouth for like <laughs> the next 20 minutes. Yeah. As, I, as I realized Joel was dying here. But also I was like, how is he, how is he going to get out of this one? Because I've seen trailers and stuff. How is he, how is he going to get out of this one, this old guy? And yeah. um, what was your reaction, guys, at that moment when... I was like, oh, gets blown oh I was like, oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> I 100% I thought we were going to see Peg Leg Joel for the rest of the game. Right. I thought we were going to get a wooden leg and he was going to get out of this somehow. But I was on edge. Well, I was in, up out of my seat. Yeah, instantly what I thought was about that, um, that gameplay clip that they sort of butchered so that it shows that Joel like holds Ellie's mouth and he's like you thought I'd let you do this on your own and I was thinking oh so Joel's gonna get like a prosthetic leg okay whatever <laughs> 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 this poor guy but they blow off his leg and um Abby sort of leans down and he's like who are you and she's like guess and instantly at that moment I was like are they fireflies Mm. I was like, are they the Fireflies for the first game? And then they don't really answer it. And I was like, oh, maybe not. Maybe I'm reading too into it. But it was just for a brief second, I was like, oh, that would make a lot of sense. <laughs> um, and I think actually that decision as a narrative makes it feel like so much more of a cohesive connection with the first game. Mm. And because the one thing that everybody sort of had to do in the first game was kill the Doctor at the end of the first game. You have yeah. to kill that Doctor. And so everyone is sort of complicit complicit in Joel dying in this game. Like you you caused this as a player if you played the first game. Um but then you then you get control back as early, you're running down and I, I didn't I didn't search for collectibles, I was just sprinting to get to Joel. Yeah. And then one of the most horrific video game sequences of all time plays out, where you see Joel basically like his brain spooled on the ground, but he's still alive. And um Ellie's just screaming and like cry, crying and begging Abby not to kill him. And you get that final hit. And I was like, yeah, Joel ain't coming back, is he? This, this He ain't getting up from that one, guys. Yeah. Um, I was I was listening to, uh, to a big podcast thing with Neil Druckmann. And he said that in one of the original takes of that scene, uh, when he sees Ellie, his brain has been so mangled up that the only word he can make out is Sarah. Oh. And all, all, that Joel, all that Joel says before he just keeps saying Sarah's name, just as he gets hit in the head. And apparently the reason they didn't include that in the game was Troy Baker was like, I think it's better if, if he doesn't say anything at all. Um, That's right. I think like that sounds good, but I think Troy Baker's right. That case yeah, too. I think it would be a bit too much like cloying for like emotional impact. Whereas yeah. what they've got here instead is a sort of look between Ellie and Joel where he's kind of saying, like, it's okay. Or he's kind of like, he's not, he's not necessarily being like, it's okay that I'm dying, but he's trying to lo- let her freak out. It's just in a look. It's literally like a nanosecond of a look. And then, boom, golf club brain. He's dead. Ellie's screaming. She's going to fucking kill all of them. It's horrible. Yeah. Um, what at, at this point and for the next sequence where you're sort of going around uh Joel's house, what were you guys feeling? What were you guys going through? It was um it's probably the saddest I felt about the character's death in anything in a really long time. Mm. <laughs> sure. I I actually like watching that scene, I think I went through a very similar journey to what Ellie goes through in that. I was sad 
that we were in this situation right up until the point that I, the golf club hit. And as soon as that happened, I was filled with rage. I was like, no, I get it. Let's go. I'm ready to kill this bitch. <laughs> um, it was horrifying and brutally truthful, and I hated it. Mm. But I loved it at the same time. And I think, uh, you know, people are saying, Joel deserved a better death than this. And it's like, no, he doesn't. Like, in this just... world, in this world, no, nobody gets a good death for doing good things or bad things. You just die. Yeah. And also, like, he's not a good person, and this is retribution for his actions at the end of part one. Um, and, you know, in a, in a lot of ways, and I hate to make this comparison without memeing it, but the, it's not the gameplay or anything or the difficulty, but the narrative of this game reminded me in some ways of the overarching plot of Dark Souls, which is the idea of the first sin. That, that creates a cycle that can never be broken or like people refuse to break. And in Dark Souls, it's a completely different uh, idea. But in this game, the idea of the first sin is Joel's, um, is Joel saving Ellie from the hospital. That was like the initial sin that has just caused so much death and so much anger. But then it's also like, well, who's more in the wrong? Is it Joel or is it Abby? Because she's just instigated more. You know, it's like this constant chicken and egg situation. Yeah. Um, but yeah, during this during this scene, I was kind of my my hand was just over my mouth for all of the mm -hmm. cutscenes, and then as soon as you're going around Joel's house, I was a mess. I was yeah. Plus, when you pick up that picture of him and Sarah, yeah, and it was like, no, she's not crying. I'm crying, I'm trying to but, tear up thinking about it. But yeah. also, <laughs> well, when we start talking about the ending, I might actually start crying because the other day I was just thinking about it and I was like, nearly sobbing. Because it's such a powerful ending, but yeah, it's that picture of Sarah. For some reason, it was the drawing that Ellie had done of Joel on his fireplace that just set me off, and I was like, I was already crying all over the place. Then she like sniffs his jacket, and then the picture of of Sarah and jo oh my god, bro! And then you can see that Joel has like clearly calmed down in life, and he started getting into wood carving. Yeah, like it's like a really stuff. nice kitchen. It's yeah. like a little pasta maker and stuff. He's like, <laughs> he's got a little pasta maker! <laughs> and, he's, and, he, and he's got, he like labels all of his jars and stuff, and he's got like a nice little house. And he's got really nice paintings all over the walls. Of like oh nice my god, stuff. and he's like, it re-embraced life and humanity and culture, that he's dead. Um, and then you get, you know, that really interesting, because at this point, Dina and Ellie are expecting to sneak out to go and get revenge, because they know they're not going to be allowed to go out. And then Maria shows up um, and basically says, you know, Tommy's gone. Tommy, Tommy left this note and has said that he's gonna, he can't let it go. He's going to go get revenge. And sort of gives them the free pass to go and gives them supplies and horses to say, you know, bring my husband home. Which is also an arguably awful choice. Yeah. Um, this, a lot of this game is people making bad choices and the wrong choice. Yeah. Um, but also respecting that you don't have input in their choices, you just you're just sort of along for the ride as a player. Um, after seeing Joel dead, thinking that was going to be later in the game, I don't know about you two, but personally, I was like, I don't know where this story is going now. Yeah. Besides, um, like besides, I knew like an Abbey switch was going to come out. Yeah. And like I know like halfway or so. So I knew that was going to happen. I didn't know what was going to happen after that. Well, the thing is, all I knew was that you played as Abby for a chunk of the game. Yeah. I, I didn't realise quite how it was going to be done or quite how big a part of the game she was going to be. Um, and at this point, I, I don't know if it was necessarily as strong as you two. I don't know. I don't know exactly. We'll talk about it. But I didn't necessarily feel ridiculous amounts of hate for Abby. But I was just like, I'm ready for her to be dead. Like, I don't really want to know anything more. I just want to find her and kill her. It is that, like, blind rage that, that Ellie is feeling in this moment. Carla, you, you sort of talked about how much you were sort of just ready to annihilate Abby at this I was, re this I was ready to kill the bitch. I was yeah. ready to kill the bitch. <laughs> uh, but I think that's... It, it took you on an interesting journey of hatred. I, I, spoke, I spoke to you about this a little, a little bit later in the game when uh, mm. you start playing as Abby. And, like, that, that idea of... I don't understand your point of view right now. I can only see the action that you've committed and it hurts. And so I hate you for it. Um, which, which is exactly what Naughty Dog are going for, I think, in the sense that like, 
you don't see the other side of the story. It's that much easier to hate. It's that much easier to have this anger behind you. Um, so yeah, from that from that moment onwards, I was like, "Kill the bitch! I'm ready." It, it, it wasn't <laughs> it wasn't until much later in the game where I was like, "Hold on a minute." I want someone to die. That's probably not a good idea. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. It, it, honestly, I, I went on such an emotional journey through this game that paralleled Ellie's, um, and in some ways was was a little bit further ahead than her. Um, mm. it, it, yeah, uh, yeah I, I think I think from what I've gathered is that Ellie and Abby are on the same journey. They're just like mm. a few different points of it. Yeah. You know, Abby is sort of dealing with this idea that she's she's got what she thought she wanted and it's not fulfilling anything in her life. Mm. And she sort of lost a lot by doing it. And mm. and Ellie is at the point where she hasn't quite got there yet. It's interesting. Harry, did you did you sort of feel this blind rage as well, or were you sort of more just sort of like, we'll see how this plays out? Yeah, I was kind of interested to see more like how like the story would progress, like because like obviously like I was like very torn up about Joel dying. I was like mostly just curious about like Abby as a character, like because she's such mm. like a she's such a question mark in like the first ten hours or so, and like finding out about her and like her backstory and like and like all the like all her friends and whatnot, like I was more intrigued by that. Like I was more intrigued in playing more of the story for that rather than just mm. getting revenge on Joel personally. Mm. Yeah, I was. Yeah. I, 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 it was just knowing that jo the ending wasn't going to be Joel getting killed. It just became this thing of like, I don't know where this game is going now. I don't know what this experience is going to be, but I'm very, very interested. Um, were you going to say something, Carl? Right? Yeah, from the, from the offset, from that, from then onwards, um, until maybe towards the end of Abby's um, playthrough, I th I thought I hundred percent thought this would end in mutually assured destruction. They'd both kill the kill each other. There would be desolation. The, I, the world. I was thinking that. Go on. Um, just because I didn't see how this sort of thing would play out in a way that was satisfying for an audience from like a game game making perspective, but mm. also from a um, situation point of view, how could both of these guys let this go when they're so filled with this rage? Yeah, but it's interesting because until Ellie starts killing people, it, it sort of seems like Abby's over it now. Like she's mm. she's kind of done with it, and because she's realised that it's brought her nothing. So, and, and obviously, you know, you find out later in the game that she basically, they all, her and Owen basically said, we're not going to kill, uh, you know, these other people. They did nothing wrong. If we do that, we're just as bad as him. Mm -hmm. And she, you know, she says the line of, we saved you and you wasted it, or we let you live mm -hmm. and you wasted it. And it's like, Abby wasn't trying to hurt Ellie. She was just getting her revenge. Yeah. Um, which was a selfish thing inherently and not really considering the bigger picture. Of it. But anyway, this, this section takes you to Seattle with Dina on horseback. And it was sort of at this point that I was starting to really buy into Ellie and Dina's relationship and how I was like, I really hope they both make it because they are a good couple and I don't want Dina to just be another tool of like revenge or used as just like a throwaway character. And it was also like, it made so much sense to me now why Dina wasn't the one we were getting revenge for, because that wouldn't have really made sense as a plot, because we, we, yeah. we, don't, we don't know Dina, we don't have a connection with her, whereas Joel is Joel. Yeah. He's the, he's, he is the last of us, and taking him uh, out of that, that picture just makes you instantly feel that grief and feel that, that loss. Um, and that that person didn't really hit for me until the end, like realizing, oh shit, Joel's dead, um, because you have all these flashbacks and things. But this, you have this beautiful opening scene with with uh, Dina and Ellie sort of traveling, th getting into further into Seattle, and they're kind of talking and joking about a bit. But there's like a tone of uh, there's a heaviness to everything, and also it's where you start to realize, oh well, this feels like The Last of Us still in terms of characters and also exploration and the gameplay and like the combat. It's like, this is very much still The Last of Us. Mm -hmm. It wasn't necessarily a revolutionary jump, but every single system was refined. And the exploration and stuff in this game is quite, uh, it, it is amplified just in terms of smashing a window to get into a building it just feels more satisfying as a player that like you made your own way in there sort of thing. Yeah. As opposed to shiving a door open or something. 100%. Yeah. Um, and then you have, this this sort of area opens up, which is is you know definitely inspiration from the last two Uncharted games, 
where suddenly you've got this massive open area and you have a map that you can explore. And it was like, oh, hell yeah, I want to go <laughs> explore in Last of Us and have all those experiences. Because you, you can go in nearly every building. Good chunk um, of yeah. Yeah. And then you get that awesome little side story, which is completely optional, about the bank heist on Outbreak Day. That was good, and, yeah. which is which is great and then you find nathan drake's ring in one of the safe boxes and stuff um and then the big moment which you know it's almost debatable that they made it optional but is ellie going into the music store with dina um and I, i'm sure you both found this but um you find the guitar and she starts to play the song that her and joel used to play together or that they bond over and then decides to play Take On Me for Dina. And the, you, she basically plays the whole song. And um, Carla, you said you got quite emotional during this scene. Oh, it was, it was beautiful. Like, th- this is a skill that's been passed down from Joel and is, is now her only way of connecting with him. Um, but, but just kind of stumbling across that in such a desolate world, mm. um, I, th- I think it added to it that it was part of the open world and optional. Because like just stumbling upon a, upon a guitar and being able to connect with him at that brief moment, beautiful, loved it. Take on me is a great song as well. I love that version. <laughs> of Slow down, take on me, brilliant. Yeah, it felt, and it also felt like a bit of a, it felt like a weird connection as well to like the old world and what like what was left of like pre twenty thirteen civilization, mm. and that that we're you know twenty something twenty four years ahead of ahead of that oh how many years after take on me came out and still this piece of, yeah. yeah and still this piece of music is is reson- resonating and still relevant to these two people it's it i thought it was a great moment harry did you uh, have any thoughts about it um i mean same like i think maybe like um because the part of like maybe it feels a bit too um syrupy hmm. almost like kind of like too sweet and um but I think because it, but I think because it's like an optional thing and you can miss it, and it's not like saying you're forced to, to partake in. It mm. just kind of excuse its like sweetness. But um, but I think in terms of the context of the world and the context of the story and everything else, it works quite well. But I think I like also it, it being that sweet, I think it's not necessarily a problem because it contrasts everything we've just had to go through. Yeah, and, and have, everything we have to go through after as well. It's yeah, like one of the few sweet, beautiful moments in the. <laughs> Yeah. The rest of it is blood and gore. Jesus Christ. <laughs> it's, a, it's a quick fleeting moment. But yeah, I get, I get what you mean, that it could come off as like cheesy in a sense. But I think, I think it is, yeah, because it's like an optional thing that you can choose to engage in. It, it makes it just like something you can stumble across. What are you going to say, Carly? I'm just thinking about it and like the respect that Dina gives it as well, just like sat there listening. I know you just sit there and listen to your friend, but like it just feels like she's laying weight to joel at that moment oh beautiful loved it <laughs> um, would do and, again and so you you travel through this massive open part of seattle which is actually one of my favorite parts of the game because i think one of my favorite things about last of us one and this one isn't necessarily the big action set pieces of the combat it's just going through desolate buildings and environments picking up supplies whilst characters talk about shit yeah for some reason that it's it's a formula that naughty dog have nailed perfectly with all of their games but like it's just picking up supplies going through stuff um whilst characters just chat and there's some great environments here and you get a sort of hint at dina's like religious background as well when they, yeah. when you go into the synagogue and also there's loads of like optional tiny stories that i'm sure i'm forgetting um and then you can find like the dog, the dog shop keys, and then you. Yeah, it's, the it's not marked on your map, but you can figure out where it is from the street signs. And then you can like use a fireman's hose to go down and find some extra supplies and stuff. It's just a really good display of all of the like exploration and some of the combat mechanics in the game. Yeah, um, it's a really good intro. Yeah. yeah, and it sort of gets you ready for what you're going through, and then you know the two of them ride on a little bit. You're like, oh, this is going to be sweet, sweet. Boom, bomb goes off, horse is dead, Dina's gone off the side of the rail, the highway. And at this point, I was like, oh no, sorry, go on, Colin. No, I was just thinking, you know, I was thinking the whole time that you're going around this open world sort of bit and then get to the horse blowing up. 
this is exactly what blind rage is. Like, she is so angry that she doesn't really know where she's going or what she's doing. She's got a path, but I'm going here, I'm going to find whoever I need to kill. And then gets ambushed because she's not t- t- taking notice of what's going on around her. That's, that's, that's the manifestation of the blind mm. rage that she feels there. Um, and, and yeah. it's also, I don't, I don't think Ellie understands why she's doing this at the moment. Mm. Yeah. She she knows that she feels like she needs to avenge Joel, but you sort of find out later on that she clearly must feel very very guilty about the fact that she never got to rectify yeah. things with him. Um, and so yeah, I think she's just so confused about why she's doing this and not sure whether she should be doing this, but is trying to sort of ignore that because she can't start thinking about it too deeply, mm. you know. Um, but then you get your first sort of introduction to human enemies, which. I was really excited for just hearing the press about like how the human enemies will constantly try and flank you and also just like how they interact with each other and like the systems around that. I was like, finally, we get to fight some humans. Um, and they, they have made the combat so fun in this game. Yeah. It's so fun and violent and visceral and just like throwing a bottle and then holding a hostage and shooting people and then taking them out it's such fast and then you've got this prone move where you can go into tables in this school and stuff and it, it's it, it's fantastic yeah it, also, it, sorry, no, on, sorry. Oh, i was just going to say it doesn't really shine against um the infected but when yeah. it comes to human encounters which the majority of this game is actually it, it really feels like it's so engaging and intense yeah, no, but it's, um, no, cause that stuff's really great. And one thing that really stuck out to me is <clears throat> much, much, much later in the game is when you're on the island <clears throat> and there's a fight between the Scars and the WLF. And I just went, I just went pro and I just like, and I just like walked out in the middle of like all these fights and like stealth my way through the whole thing. That is exactly what I did as And it's well. so cool because like they're all like, because they're fighting each other, it feels so realistic. Yeah. Like they're constantly moving around and everything. And you're just like hiding it away from every all of them. And also, it, 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 that was a, we'll get to that actually i'll put that in my notes because that's a really um i'm actually going to bring that up because it it felt like it was a really interesting way of making a statement about the violence in the game and the violence between these factions and tribalism without you having to do a single thing because you can fight in that battle you can start killing people but yeah i also i don't know about you carla did you did you also just completely sneak through I'll admit that this game was not my forte in terms of stealth. I uh, I think I alerted pretty much every encounter that I was in, okay. but I tried. <laughs> I yeah. tried, and that's what mattered. No, there, were, there were a few opportunities where I kind of just let them have a go at the infected or have a go at each mm. other, but usually I didn't know. I, yeah, it was just a, a beautiful moment where you're just kind of like caught in the crossfire and mm. n- 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 none of these people are on the right side. Yeah. Um, but yeah, anyway, you, you it blows up, you're fighting human enemies, you think Dina might be dead, and then Dina comes through the roof, and she hurts her back, and you're desperately mashing square to cut your rope to go stab the guy oh God, yeah, I forgot in the that. throat. Um, then you have this whole section, you go through the subway with Ellie, you, you sort of turn clickers on these, on these uh, wolves as well. That's always um, cool. And I think just before this moment as well, you went through the hotel and found what Tommy had done to those two guys interrogating. Yeah, you do the interrogation thing, yeah. Um, which is, you sort of a throwback as well to what Joel does when he's trying to find Ellie in the first game. Um, and interesting, again, Ellie tries to do it herself later on in the game and just completely fucks up on it. It's not going well. <laughs> no. Um, but yeah, you realise that Tommy is kind of like, it was that moment of clicking, like, Tommy is on a different mission, like, he is... He feels like he's failed his brother here and he is like completely going mad and like violent and you're seeing a side of Tommy that we necessarily didn't even think was there as a character. Um, but you play through the section and eventually you make your way to the theatre, which is sort of the hub base of the game. Um, I thought it was really interesting that it was a, a theatre and also a movie theatre um, and that connection with Joel's love for, you know, action movies and stuff and there's yeah, that was, for it. That was probably the sweetest thing is just just talking about how Joel loves really crappy action movies. Yeah. <laughs> um <laughs> he loves them. He loves them. Um and also he loves Jurassic Park. Yeah. And like yeah and it was just it was really nice. It's also just a creepy environment um as well, especially like the back rooms with like all of the I it's something 
me and Carl I know anyway, but like prop rooms in theatres are creepy inherently. Yeah, they are just, yeah. They're just <laughs> fucking creepy because there's so much around you that feels kind of alive and a bit too realistic. Just it's just it's just a creepy environment, but an empty theater is always creepy. Um but you get you, you sort of let Dina sleep and she reveals that she's pregnant and yeah. at this moment you're like, for fuck's sake, Dina. <laughs> Because cause Ellie's also struggling now because, and it's, it's a recurring theme, but it's like, she doesn't know what she wants anymore because she wants to look after Dina, but does she want that more than she wants to put her in danger possibly to get revenge? Anyway, you get you get the guitar and you have a little moment where she tries to play the song again and then just sort of leans on it. And you get one of my favorite sequences in the game, which is the flashback to Ellie's birthday going to the dinosaur museum. Um, fellas, any any thoughts on this section? It's it's great and um, it's so sweet and nice just having to like hang out again and they're like, basically the same age as they were in the first game. Mm. And it's also like there's that bit towards the end and I feel like the most freaked out I've been when playing a game in a while is when you go into that building by yourself as Ellie, and it gives you ammo, it gives you supplies, so you think something's got to come up because like the game's kind of conditioned you into thinking yeah. that. And then, like, you get there, and, like, nothing's there. <laughs> but, like, you're so freaked out into thinking something's definitely going to be there. <laughs> I think it was it also having this flashback moment makes you realise about what people... I saw a few reviews talking about how um, different the narrative structure is in this game to some of other Naughty Dog games. And I was like, how many flashbacks are we going to get? How frequent is this going to be? And And I actually think it was a really good way... Of making it, of making Joel still feel completely central to the narrative, yeah. um, but also having him dead, and it's such a great sequence. And you, she finds a dinosaur and can jump off the dinosaur, yeah. and it also teaches you how to swim. It's it's a tutorial for how to swim, and you're like playing it, and you're like, oh, they're showing me this, so I know how to swim in the game. It's a tutorial, but then by the time you finish this section, you completely forgot that that was even even there. Yeah, and you're going through the museum, and you, you, I don't know how what you guys did, but you put the hats on and put the hats on each dinosaur and put yeah. a hat on Joel, uh, and then you have this beautiful sequence where you get in the uh, astronaut shuttle um, with Joel, and he's sort of get, got her a present of this countdown for the for a rocket launch, and it, it's very reminiscent of Left Behind DLC where Riley's describing the arcade, and you've got the lights in Ellie's face. It's a very beautiful moment, and it's a very positive moment and light moment in an otherwise quite dim game. Um, mm -hmm. And I and I do actually like that there's no combat encounter and there's no real threat. It's just it, yeah. And, and when you get into that second building and Ellie find you sort of find these these writings on the wall. wall. Yeah, it's so creepy. <laughs> this guy who's like I killed for them and all this other stuff, and he's like look basically lost his mind and you find out that he came back to this um he's a firefly who came back to this museum after it all disbanded because he wanted to like find something positive in his life and then instead just decided to blow his brains out um it it, it it's sort of reminiscent as well of their relationship in how regardless of what happiness they can go through at this point in time ellie underneath all of it you know, when she goes to the core of it, she still has these doubts about Joel and still has these feelings that she can't, um, the, the, the stuff that she can't shake that she feels so unsure about him with. And then obviously you find the big firefly symbol with the liars written underneath it. And in that moment, Ellie, I think Ellie is sort of thinking, you know, it's bringing up all these memories of everything to do with the fireflies. And also just like, if, if she, if, if, you sort of realise as a player that if Joel hadn't done what he did in the first game, this guy would still be alive. This guy wouldn't have blown... Would be alive. Yeah, mm -hmm. a lot of people. This guy wouldn't have blown his brains out in this museum. Um, anyway, that's the end of Flashback 1. And then we're back in the theatre. Dina's awake, and I think you just decide to go off on your own to find Tommy, supposedly, in one of the sections. Um... And you go through the suburbs, which is one of the big gameplay sections they showed. You get introduced to dogs for the first time, which um, I don't know if either of you killed a dog with a machete at any point, but that is going to haunt me for a while. 
I really didn't want to kill the dogs in the game. <laughs> I really didn't want to. You can get through that whole section without killing anybody. Yeah. Um, it's a lot harder. I, but I, I killed think, everybody. Yeah, I <laughs> yeah, killed everybody. And I don't know about you guys, but uh, in a lot of encounters, if you like kill, if you like shoot the last person in the leg or the stomach, they'll often just fall to the ground, and you get like this big cinematic finisher on them, or you like smash their head in. Um, I got that a few times. Yeah, um, and it's not nice. And they're basically <laughs> begging for their life. And Ellie's never gonna not do it. Um, and when you have those sections in like the TV station or something, if you if you kill that guy or blow their head off, Dina would just be like, "Jesus Christ, Ellie!" Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and you sort of get this sense that Ellie, Ellie ain't doing the right thing. And like someone's on the floor begging for their life, and she just starts reloading a shotgun and says, "Shut up!" and blows their head off. Um, yeah. It's also like when it's also when you grab someone to do a stealth kill, so mm. quiet. They're just like immediately. The, the stealth kills are interesting because when you take them hostage as well, uh, the Seraphites are quite confident, but all the WLF are like, "Please don't do anything stupid." And she's always like, "Shut the fuck up!" and then just stabs them in the neck. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you're like, "Oh, Ellie. Oh dear. Oh dearie, dearie, dear." Stop this. And it, and it is also the dogs in this game is they are actually such a formidable and like threatening thing to like disturbing your stealth as well that you're like I have to kill it because it's gonna find me um and I, f- with dogs I often would just place down a proximity bomb and wait for it to yeah, follow yeah, the scent yeah. but yeah it's uh I, I think it's interesting Carly because you said that you know you said just stout you never were able to stealth through environments but I think the way that the combat is designed is it's more of like a you duck in and out of stealth constantly um, you go from the the default for me was always I'm going to try and sneak through this as best as I can, and inevitably you will get caught because of how good the systems are. Um, you'll get caught, and then you'll find a way to sort of lose, let them lose sight of you, and then you're back. Yeah, in to be fair, that's that's what I found. I found it much easier to lose them and to to head back into stealth than I think any other previous stealth game I've kind of played. Uh, yeah. And that that was quite enjoyable. Like, yeah, and it and it feels more realistic in that sense of like, there's not two states of they don't know you're there, or they everyone knows where you are exactly. It's, yeah, it's like a bit wishy washy. Yeah, yeah. Is... it makes it makes everyone feel a bit more human where they don't necessarily know where you are. Um, but you get through this whole section, and then you drop down, and at this point I was like, wait, this is the cutscene where Joel turns up. This is the cutscene in the trailer where Joel puts his hand over your mouth and says, you think I'd let you do this on your own? And I was like, is it going to be Tommy? They're going to swap it out with Tommy, aren't they? And then it was Jesse. And it was just, it was, it was one of these big moments of like, oh, wow, I really don't know where this game is going because they've clearly just been lying <laughs> in all of their marketing. And I don't have a problem with that at all. Because um, mm-hmm. I think it preserves the, like, the actual context of the story. But having Jesse turn up like that and having it actually make sense of like, why the fuck are you here? This is not a place for you to be. And then you get a more Uncharted-esque action sequence with him where you're driving away in the car and shooting people chasing you. I think I think this game definitely ups the action from the first game. Yeah, I think it's probably like... I think I think it's probably got about the same amount of scripted events as the first game mm. cause, because it's spread out over like probably like an extra like five ten hours longer than the first game yeah it feels like it like it feels like they're more sparsed out and like but also like, those scripted moments are often a bit more cinematic or a bit more dynamic and like you're moving through an environment and stuff yeah like a car a car chase scene um so anyway you find jesse you go back to the theater with him and i think it's here when you get the flashback with joel and ellie in the hotel that's it right here you start off with tommy yeah yeah um, which, which is another great tutorial of teaching you how to use sniper rifles and like the marks for you know sights on the on the rifles, and then you have this very long sequence of Joel and Ellie going through this hotel, and some very close calls and some great conversations. And one of the moments that stuck out to me is you know Ellie gets grabbed by the clicker um the the bloater, which. Let's just let's just take a moment to acknowledge how fucking grotesque the infected <laughs> design in this game is. Yeah, awful, They're disgusting. <laughs> in it, I've I've spent so much time in the model viewer just looking at the bloater. 
because it's got like fleshy, hairy fungus. And it's disgusting. And also with the shamblers, which we haven't even mentioned, but like they've got a massive shit stain up their back. <laughs> it's disgusting. <laughs> but yeah, the bloater grabs Ellie, puts its fingers in her mouth, which is the you know famous killing scene Kill, from the, head the first game. And I'm like, oh fuck, I've lost. And then Joel comes out of fucking nowhere and starts slicing its arm off and kills it with just like brute force. Yeah. And you're like, wow, okay, Joel, calm down, bro. <laughs> but um, also, it's a great showcase of the, what they've done with the bloaters in this game, where they become more of like a massive force of destruction rather than just a big, strong clicker. Because yeah. bloaters can smash through doors and walls and nothing will stop them if they're trying to chase you. Um, it's a good sequence. And then it ends with them finding these teenagers who tried to escape Jackson and Ellie sort of confronting Joel about, you know, why there wasn't a cure. And she's sort of angry that Joel took her out of the hospital before she could talk to any of them. And Joel, once again, probably makes the, ba- the wrong decision of choosing to lie to her once again. Um, lying to her about what actually happened. Um, and, he, and he gives that good, that good speech, which was implied in trailers to be later on in the game. But he says, you know, you wish things were different. I wish things were different, but they ain't. Um, at, what, what did you guys think of this hotel sequence while you were playing through it? Very reminiscent mm. of the first game. Mm. Yeah. Like that, I don't know, yeah, yeah. They just kind of show all aspects of their relationship from the first game as continuing. And I thought th- this was probably the most safe that I felt during the game, just because I was with Joel again. Uh, and, and we were going through that whole, let's get it, kill these clickers, see what we can mm. find. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, it really did just feel like a... Like a... Like a little, um, like one little chapter from the first game. Mm. It's just such a short little thing, and that bloater fight. Because I remember when you get caught by him, like I visibly said, "Oh shit, I'm dead." And yeah. it's when Joel comes in. A good bit, yeah. And that, good. And that, yeah. Thanks, Joel. That's all not. <laughs> I think, and then I think the um, <clears throat> I think the day that follows this is Ellie hunting down Nora. Yeah. Um, or, or it's, the, it's the same day but she's left Dina and Jesse to stay and she's going to go get Nora yeah yeah go to the hospital yeah that's it yeah. so this is the journey towards the hospital which uh, I don't remember too much about the journey of getting there but the hospital section um, is, is quite short but what, what's notable is the um, the death of Nora and you get the first Last of Us well not the first but you get a Last of Us style chase scene through this hospital um, and you get, you know, you get this sense of Ellie just being a, a uh, just a beast of raw rage at this point. And also she's finally found someone who was literally holding her down whilst Joel was being killed. And you know that she's like, she doesn't feel any remorse for this person. Um, she's chasing her down and then D- Nora's basically like begging her, like, don't kill me. Also, we can't go down there because there's spores everywhere. And then Ellie jumps in, in with her and Nora starts getting infected. And, and it's just horrible. It's like you're, you're forcing someone to get infected um, and you're going to kill them anyway and torture them. You get a great little section here where you get, to, you get to use the clickers against the WLF again. And then you're walking down this red flashing hallway. Nora realises that you're immune and you're the, you're the girl that they, they heard about. And... Um, and she wants Ellie wants to know where Abby is, and Nora is not going to tell her. And mm-hmm. so, and all you see is the rage in Ellie's eyes build up, and then it's just press square, press square again. And I don't know about you two, but I thought Ellie had just killed Nora. I thought that she had just killed her. Yeah, but you, re- you you realize in the next scene that she tortured her. Yeah, she yeah, tortured yeah. her to get the information because she's kind of shaken by like what she's done to some to a human being. Um, and you get this, you get the scene with her and Dina, and she's sort of recovering, and she's crying, and she's bruised and cut up. Do you, do you guys have any thoughts about this section? Um, I don't know, because because um, there's that part where it makes you press square a few times, like to like the hitter with the bat, hit with mm. the um, metal pipe, and I really didn't want to press the button. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I really didn't want to press square at all. But like, like it, it, it ends up leaving like a few seconds between, just because I just didn't really want to do it, but. 
I don't know. I think it, I think maybe that bit felt a little bit like ham fisted of like, oh, you have to do this. Isn't Ellie a terrible person? Like, I understand what I was trying to go for, but like, because it, like, yeah, I feel I felt like if that was a cutscene, it wouldn't have felt any different, personally. Possibly, but I think interesting. I think what you're saying is probably what Ellie's going through as a character, though, is she's angry and she knows what she needs to do but she's also realizing this isn't necessarily me as a person why am i doing this and she doesn't i don't think she wants to do it necessarily either yeah and it, and it ties into that theme again of like her trying to be joel or tommy and she's just not right but i get i i, I, I get the, what you mean i think I, th- I don't but i don't think the message is like isn't ellie a monster because i don't think it's time for no, reflection at this point I don't think it's that. Um, no, it's definitely not. But I feel like, but I don't think the scene would have felt necessarily that different if you like if if it didn't have the button presses in there. Mm, okay. But yeah. Carly. I I just marvel that how clever it was to turn the camera around. Right. Like to have to have us looking at Ellie instead of looking at at Nora. Um, because that, that 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 is probably the moment that I put the reflection beginning. You start you start to see Ellie as this beast, um, and yeah, I, I equally. Well, did I want to press square? I think there was there was a part of me that did want to press square. I'm a bad person. <laughs> but also, Ellie. you you feel a bit more riled up about because she like mocks Joel's death. Yeah, a mm. little bit. Yeah, Br- brutal. But yeah, it's it's interesting that they they chosen they chosen that scene to just show the aftermath of what it does to Ellie, as mm. opposed to here's a really violent scene of Ellie torturing someone, which I think would have felt, you no, know, to what Harrison was saying was would have felt more ham fisted if it was like watch this ten minute scene of Ellie torturing someone and getting information. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think you Ellie rests here, and then you get. I think this is the point where you get the third flashback of her going back to the Saint Mary's Hospital. Um, so Ellie Ellie goes through, and you find these notes, and you find this tape recorder, and you get this confrontation where Joel and Ellie, you know, he finally tells her the truth. Do you do you guys have anything to say about this scene? Did it make you feel any particular way? Um. Maybe not. <laughs> no, uh, no. Just thinking because that that scene was a heavy one. Yeah, and it also comes like also because like I think um, after the previous scene, you kind of know it's going to happen at some point, and cause, and I feel like um, because you've just I think also because it takes place immediately after a scene, which wouldn't have happened if Joel didn't save Ellie, mm. like, where Ellie has to do something early, does something terrible. And it's kind of Joe's fault in a way, and I think it kind of shows like, oh yeah, like I think it show. I think I think that's where the game kind of first starts to show, just like how awful Joe's decision was mm. in saving Ellie, and like brings in the and brings in them, <clears throat> and brings in ideas of just how like negative Did... um, this whole like the ending of the previous game was. Yeah. Did you guys think that Ellie knew that Joel had done it? That they ever had that conversation before before she's gone on this revenge journey? I think she basically knew, but I don't think. But both, I think she like I think she knew it like inside yeah. her head, but she didn't want to admit it. Yeah, and that was just getting yeah. to that point emotionally. Well, I, I to me to me it was like her going through Seattle. I thought, and like Nora saying, don't you think it's bad what she did? I thought Ellie didn't really ever know what Joel did in the first game. She, I, I wasn't sure whether or not she ever got that um, reveal. And I thought later in the game, she was going to find out about what Joel did to the Fireflies and stuff, and then suddenly start questioning her actions. But it was interesting that you find out she already knew. Mm. And then it's like, she understands their violence and is still doing what she's doing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And when she realizes that Nora is a Firefly, Jesse sort of asks her about it the next day. And she just lies to him because she's yeah, I like, that. I can, I can never explain it. They'll never understand what he did. She says it in her journal. She says, they'll never understand why he did it. And then she's like, do I understand why he did it? Uh, yeah, it's interesting that she just decides to lie because she, she clearly understands how wrong a choice it was. And, and she's still going on her, you know, quest for revenge. Um, anyway, you get, you get a big section with her and Jesse fighting WLF and Sarah fights. 
and then they sort of get split up and you start you start getting this pathetic fallacy of the of the thunder coming in and the rain and jesse's like it's an interesting point jesse's like we came out here to find tommy and go home tommy is this way and ellie is still justifying it to herself of like no if we go to the aquarium where abby is so i can kill abby then then it'll work out and you can tell that she doesn't actually care or she's not making the right decision she doesn't actually care about finding tommy she just wants to get her revenge at any excuse and she's trying to find her way to still get it yeah. and still make the right choice which is, she can't because it's not the right choice to go but you get an awesome sequence where you're doing the hide and seek sort of gameplay in and out of underwater in this and then you steal this boat and you have That's good. that was really cool and also, ride it on the stream. <laughs> and also how they did like exploration with the boat and stuff and you can like go up that like, like dilapidated subway um, carriage and like go up into the skyscrapers I found on my second playthrough um, there's like a boat one of the places you can go on the boat is like a it's like a broken subway carriage and you can go up it and keep exploring okay. and there's stuff to find I mean it also gives you a vantage point to shoot that bit, yeah. that yeah. bit was so cool I really like that bit I, like, I, love, I love the exploration of it yeah no, I really get like the excessive use of rope swing and then you can, like take out all of them yeah. Like several meters up. Really. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then obviously she sees the aquarium in the distance, and thunder. And oh, before this, you know, you go to the arcade, which is a oh, cool little sequence of like she's going through, it, and then you see the arcade game from the first from Left Behind. Yeah, you see Angel Knives, yeah. And I thought she was going to make a comment on it. I thought it would she be something you could, she doesn't at all. Yeah. Um. I. I Naughty Dog must have known that people would have tried to have interacted with it, though. I feel like they would have, yeah. I don't know why they didn't. Mm. Even if it was just her looking at it and just, like, sighing or something, I don't know. Anyway, then you push through this thing and then suddenly you're fighting another bloater. And another great secret showing these bloaters being these, like, masses of destruction where just smashing arcade cabinets and, like, breaking through walls and stuff, trying to claw at you and kill you. But um, then you go on the boat, you go in towards the aquarium, the storm is pretty bad, the waves are pretty bad, Ellie's in the water, you have to swim as her getting hit by waves and nearly drowning, and then getting onto the aquarium docks. And you sort of see the state of Ellie and the world around her, and you're like, this, this isn't good. Every, everything has kind of gone very bad right now, Ellie. And she doesn't have Jesse anymore. She's chosen revenge over trying to save Tommy as the priority. And you go in and you stab the fucking dog. Alice! <laughs> Alice! And it's, and it's one of those things where I didn't realise until later on that it was Alice. And I yeah. was like, oh no, I stabbed the shit out of this dog, bro. It, it came to me just before you got back to the aquarium. And I was like, oh, again. fuck, that dog is the dog. That dog is the one I killed. Yeah. And you're playing He's fetch with it girl. and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then you go through, and there's a scuffle. And yeah, this is what we're talking about, where Ellie tries to be Joel. She tries to do the whole mark out on the map thing, and if you're wrong, you better be say the same thing. She tries to do it, but she's not really in control of the situation. And then, boom, she shot Owen which at this point doesn't mean much to us as a player. Yeah. But Owen's dead. And then she fucking stabs a pregnant woman in the throat. And it's a bit of a grim moment. <laughs> um, but even at this point, I think that what makes these moments special is like, you, don't you can understand these things aren't necessarily exactly right. But you as a player, I don't think necessarily feel completely... Um, wrong about what you've done because it's like well they got in my way they tried to fight back you know they were part of the crew they deserved to die kind of thing or like well i know mel was pregnant but she she was trying to stab me kind of thing mm. um then tommy finds you and you all go back to the theater and you do a bit of reflecting with uh with jesse and ellie is clearly upset that abby is still alive but she's gonna have to just accept it and then you start hearing a scuffle, and you're like, what the fuck is that? Boom. Jesse's dead. Yeah. Bang, bang, bang. Which I mean, is another... 
it didn't uh-huh. really phase me that much. I don't really like. I don't really mind Jesse. I didn't care for him that much. Not that much, but I think it, it made a statement a little bit about what to expect in terms of characters can just die at any point. Yeah. And it, and it won't be ceremonious and it won't be like a big moment. They'll just die. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then boom, Abby's there, angry, pissed off, muscly. Um, <sighs> and then you suddenly transition to a flashback as young Abby with her dad. Now, Carla, you messaged me at this point. What were your thoughts at this uh, point? I think, I think my little literal words to you were, no, no, I'm out. I don't want to play as Ellie. No, no. It, it, um, was, I don't, it was, I don't want to play as this fucking bitch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I was just like, this is such a clever way to use a game form narrative to get someone to experience what I experienced in that moment. Because as I said earlier, BLM's on my mind. Um, if you're a racist and you hate a black person, you're not, and you, you don't understand that black person, you don't understand where they've come from, their upbringing, what, what actions um, they've done and what's led them to that, those decisions. Um, and because you don't understand all of that, it's easy to hate someone. It's easy to say, mm. no, I hate you for whatever, for this reason. Um, and so in the same vein, I didn't want to play as Abby. I didn't want to justify her actions because it was easy to hate her up to that point. And mm-hmm. as soon as you start playing through her, it's like, oh, for God's sake, I understand why you did this. I get it. Don't necessarily like it, but I get it. Uh, and you have to sympathize. Um, so yeah, I instantly had a, a reaction of like, I don't, I don't mm. want to do this. Well, um, yeah, I, I, it's, well, we'll get onto that in a second, but you, you know, you just think, oh, I'm just playing as Abby in a flashback maybe. Um, and then you keep going, and I and I didn't necessarily feel the strong sense of connection with Abby and her dad or Abby and Owen. But what oh, you do, st- yeah, but what you do start to understand is just what Joel took away from her, mm. um, and it wasn't just her dad; it was her life, it was her entire existence and like group, and the hope for the future of what was sort of guaranteed at this point of of, of a possible cure. Mm. And, you know, this, this zebra moment, um, a lot of people will think it sort of mirrors the giraffe moment it, for, for Joel and Ellie. It's this, it's this sort of, you know, escape zoo animal, weird interaction that you weren't expecting. Um, and then you realise that uh, fucking Abby collects coins. Yeah. Oh, um, that was another point. I was like, no, don't fucking humanise the bitch. I don't care. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to collect these damn coins. <laughs> Um, but then you go on, and then it pops up saying Seattle, day one, mm. and you sort of realise, oh shit, I'm going to play through all of this again from the other perspective. Yeah. What were you thinking at this point? Were you excited? Were you interested? Or um, I was like, um, at first, like I still wasn't entirely on board with the with the idea of playing as Abby. Mm. Like from an emotional point, I don't really like her that much. And, and the only thing, like the biggest scene she was like, the biggest thing she'd done by this point was kill Joel. Yeah, I can't quite, and you can't quite rationalize that in your head yet, <clears throat> and you don't know like, I mean, it's like, I feel like you probably know um, that a lot of the people who you killed in Ellie's bits, you also they like, you're probably going to meet in Abby's, mm. which you immediately get, <clears throat> and I wasn't quite on board with how to feel about it, but I feel like by Seattle Day Two, I was like completely on board with her, mm. like emotionally, from that point. But yeah. Carly, when you realised this wasn't just a flashback and it was going to be, you know, basically the second half of the game, how did yeah. you feel? You know what? I I think I worked it out earlier than that. I think as, as soon as we saw, as soon as I collected a fucking coin, I was like, oh, okay, I understand that, that you're going to show me this side of the story. Um, I I was intrigued more than anything else. Mm. Yeah. And despite despite her story, which is beautiful and brilliantly acted, acted, um, I don't think I fully got on board with her at any point. Right. Because uh, she ended up being my favourite character in the whole game. Yeah, me too. And, and her bits are like my favourite parts of the game. Yeah. Parts we yeah. play as her. Because they feel like more, they feel like unique moments of New Last of Us. Mm. I, yeah, I see that. I do, I, do, I do think she's a brilliant character, and I do think that the, the story that they put her through is well worth it. Um, but I don't know, there was, there was some sort of um, dissonance between me and her throughout the mm. entire game. Yeah. 
it, yeah, it, and then so you start with interacting with Manny, who was this guy who literally spat on Joel's body. Yeah. And um, at no point was I like, oh God, I don't want to do this. I think I was so accepting of whatever story Naughty Dog wanted to give. Yeah. I didn't really mind. And I was like, I was actually just happy. I was like, I had an idea of how much content was left. And it was a huge amount. You know, because 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 when you get to that theater level, you start thinking, "Am I close to the end of the game?" Yeah, and and it was so much more yet to see. And that first day of Seattle, um, is basically just going about WLF movements, and and they have these conversations about justifying why uh, the Seraphites are evil, but the Fireflies weren't. And all these other things about tribalism and you get another cool action set piece with shooting off of a car and you hang out with Mel and Manny a little bit and you sort of start to understand them as characters. And, um, and then you realize that Owen is in trouble because he's supposedly shot another member of the WLF. Um, you also, I don't know if you found this, there's an optional conversation with PS Vita girl playing hotline oh yeah i found that yeah and (laughs) and i was like oh god she's kind of (laughs) cool and when you you see her again at the hospital as abby i was like oh god i stabbed the fuck out of you (laughs) poor bitch i like hot mommy abby too like (laughs) um can we can we just give um give alice a rating at this point of a rating yeah, how how well, good was that? Before Alice you've met her, point? you're like one out of ten. She's she's at least a good girl. She's a, she's a, yeah, yeah, she's a bad. But girl. then you go also. I don't know about you guys. I was actually stunned by the stadium as like a visual thing. Yeah, I when when you first get into that stadium, you realize this is the perfect place for someone to create a, a settlement, and they've yeah. they've kind of built a life around this place. But yeah. what was also stunning to me is the amount of unique animations they have of people like farming and like cutting meat and all this other stuff, which you just walk through and you never really see. And it's such a visual spectacle and such an interesting environment. And also you start to sort of see the parallels between this place and Jackson. Yeah. And how, yeah. And they are one in the same. And And before this point, you see the WLF as like, I don't know about you, but you see them as kind of like a really aggressive, evil group. And then you sort yeah. of realise they're just doing the same thing that we did. They're just yeah, because like, um, it's before that point, you just kind of see them as like a militant, like militia yeah. group. You don't really see any of the humanity there. Yeah. I think Abby's bit, there's a lot to establish that really well. Yeah. <laughs> and then you saw that, you see that Manny is kind of like this ladies' man who's constantly fricking people. And also, Abby uh, loves books. She loves books. And and you realise that okay, this bitch uh likes animals, loves books, and loves collecting coins. And you're like, oh my god, she's oh, such a fu- I... she's such a fucking geek. <laughs> she's just she's just a really geeky teenage girl who had something horrible happen to her and then transformed her entire body and life to get revenge. Yeah. She's just a geeky bitch. That's it. And um there's an interesting thing as well, because when you go through one of the later levels, if you go through the lib- the like dead bookstore, she's like, oh, there's so many books. I'll come back for some of them and stuff. Um, but anyway, Abby decides to go after Owen, um, who we see in a quick flashback. is uh, th- They used to be a couple at one point. Um, and also you find out that Abby has this intense fear of heights. Mm-hmm. Um, and you go through these, this old aquarium with, with Owen, and you realise, oh, this is the aquarium where... I killed him. Yeah. And and you and it becomes such a place of like love and safety for Abby and Owen. And you're like, this is such a different this is the theatre equivalent, I guess. It's like the safe zone of the game. Um and obviously there's loads of details I'm missing. There's a really cool uh family story there about kids joining the Seraphites and the dad just sitting in his armchair and dying in the aquarium. And then you also get Abby and Owen trying to like kissing. And Abby just not being able to be into it because she's too focused about, I want to go to training so that I can get buff and kill Joel. Yeah. And and you can tell that this obsession has like destroyed all of her relationships slowly. Um, at, at this point, guys, when when you know you're going through this aquarium again with Abby and Owen as teenagers, did you have any do you have any thoughts or feelings about this? I mean, for personally, I started to like Owen a bit more. Yeah, um, I don't think I ever really like 
really cared for Owen. He always seemed kind of annoying mm. as a character, but um, I sort of liked him quite a bit. And I think um, I think that's when you first really start to sympathise with Abby mm. and like everything about her and like all the. I think that's when you first really start to sympathise with her mm. and all her friends and whatnot. And I think it's um, I think it's when the game starts to like like the dual um, storylines kind of starts to click mm. more. In that yeah, because yeah. I, I messaged you, Harry, before you played the game, and I said that it took me like 15 hours, and I still wasn't sure how I felt about it, and then suddenly it all started to click. Yeah, and I think it was around this point, it all started to click as one cohesive narrative. Um, and what's interesting, you know, a lot of people will say that the second half of this game is all about criticising Ellie, but Neil Druckmann, in one of the interviews I was listening, he said, you know, we're not, neither side is meant to be criticising. We just wanted to present two sides of the same story and let you feel how you feel about it. Um, just see the different sides of that, that those encounters. Anyway, after this, you start playing as Abby going towards Owen. And this all goes terribly fucking wrong because Abby walks directly into the middle of a Seraphite camp and gets knocked the fuck out oh, by, God, a, yeah, 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 yeah. by a big <laughs> bitch with the, with the pickaxe. And she bites her ear off. And you sort of get this sense, yeah, you get this sense that Abby is just like a monster as well in terms of violence. But also, when you're playing as her, she plays quite differently to Ellie. It, it, like she's this, you can play them exactly the same, but like their skill trees and stuff are designed to play differently. And yeah, like so, the, uh, also sorry, the animations feel heavier. Like also yeah. Abby's animations feel heavier. And it's like she is, she's a tank. And she like chokes out someone with just a raw muscle. Yeah. It's an easy life, like to kill someone, <laughs> <laughs> and like st just stabs her neck. And then sometimes, if she has a shiv, it's not like a slow interaction. She just stabs it in the brain and then pushes them aside. Mm. Um, but Abby is all about just like efficiency, get it done. She's military trained. Yeah, and you get the hot guns differently. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And you get the the difference between the playstyle is like Ellie is kind of this like stealthy, scrappy fighter, and and then Abby is just like a muscle machine and like especially the momentum upgrade which i don't know if any of you got yeah I did, but yeah. it's yeah it's like if you deli if you shoot someone in the leg and then strike them you can then strike immediately so you can go up to two people and just completely kill them with your fists <laughs> and yeah she's just a machine and i i i love it in these types of games it happened in god of war as well when you get the blades but you realize that this isn't just a small thing this is fully fleshed out um, and you look that Abby has her own skill trees, yeah, and has her own weapons. And I was like, okay, we're doing this. But yeah, she gets knocked out, and then you get the famous violent cutscene that was shown at Paris Games Week like three years ago, yeah. of Abby getting hung from a tree, and then that first interaction with Yara and Lev. Um, and then Lev decides to cut. Well, Yara tells Lev to cut to cut Abby down even though she's a wolf and I feel this I actually really like this section of gameplay because it feels like quite a um it feels like a testament to how like satisfying the melee combat is in this game because mm. all, all, all it is is picking up hammers and like bricks and stuff and killing stalkers with it dodging yeah. them and stuff it's also when also because like the games it's also quite an effective horror game at mm. point and I think it's also when it's uh, like at its best when you just like, you can't see a single thing around you besides this flame Mm. You have all these like monsters coming at you, mm. and you have your fist to like stop them. Good stuff. Yeah, <clears throat> I thought this part, this part of the game was probably my favorite visually. I thought, yeah, in terms of the graphics and the way they like lit the the scenes. Mm. And then um, you catch up, you uh, you go through a little bit more, and then Lev is getting attacked by the the big bitch whose ear you bit off earlier, and you get this one on one fist fight. And it's really cool, and they have these brutes throughout the game, which are kind of like skill checks of your hand-to-hand -hand combat. Um, I just really like this section as well, because the, the woman recognises you, and she's like, you! Because you bit my <laughs> fucking ear off! And then, and then I, th I, don't, I can't remember, I think she bites her again, or she grabs her ear or something, and it, it's how she finally kills her, and then, and then hits her in the fucking head with the pickaxe. Um, Obviously, this game is very violent, and the melee kills, especially, are incredibly violent at points. Especially, especially for some reason, just something that disturbed me was how the blood pours out when Ellie stabs someone in the neck. It just like streams. It's a constant stream just coming out of the neck. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's when the body like falls in a puddle, 
and the blood yeah. starts to drift off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so you go with Yev and Lara, Yev and Lara, Lev and Yara. Um, Yara has had her left arm smashed in, um, and is clearly struggling with it. Um, you escape to this sort of like abandoned, I think it's a caravan park or like office buildings or something. And Abby helps her to set the, the arm, but then carries on on her way to go find Owen at the aquarium. Um, this is as far as I've played up to. This moment is as far as I've played up to in my new game plus. Right. So I haven't quite finished, so it's not quite as sharp for me, but I've still got my notes. Um, then you meet Owen at the aquarium again, and this is where you have the quite explicit sex scene. Um, I mean, I would say it's like, I mean, it doesn't show that they're like the. No, but I don't know if I've ever seen. I don't know if I've ever heard flesh slapping in a video game before. All right, okay. <laughs> I wasn't the greatest fan of that. I think that kind of took me out of it for a second, to be honest. Yeah, I guess. I mean, it's like an okay scene. It doesn't it's take like, me out of it at all. But um, I mean, but yeah, you... I mean, in terms of like video game sex scenes, you should go. It's like Shakespeare. So yeah. <laughs> 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 you, you ever seen this same scene in Heavy Rain, where like Ethan Mars is just worried about his son being dead, and she's like, "But frick me!" And then they just start making out awkwardly, and then just, oh, it's awful. Or just those scenes of Ride to Hell where they're like still wearing but like full clothes and they're dry on. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. But yeah, and then uh, I think Abby gets a quick flashback to the night where she found her dad. De- a dad's body and then she's like reminded of like Yev and La- Lev and Yara and she sees them like strung up in her dream um, and I think this was the moment where I clicked with Abby because she starts to become the role of the protector and she starts to become Joel essentially mm. um, mm. She's, she starts to become a more human person again by finding it through her companions and also she feels guilt and like a sense of she needs to look after these people who saved her. And also, like, this other idea in the game, which is, you know, if a hateful act begets another hateful act, but also, like, selfless acts and kindness can also reciprocate more kindness. Um, mm-hmm. And so she goes back to Lev and Yara to look after them and then looks at Yara's arm and realises it's completely fucking shattered. Um, and then takes her to Mel, who is... They're not too happy about it, but um, Mel is like, we need all these supplies. And throughout all of these moments, you realise that Owen kind of doesn't, hasn't ever agreed with the WLF. And he, he's never really felt completely on board with it and also is just, like, done with it. Because he has this story about that he saw a, uh, a Seraphite out and he just couldn't kill him because he was just an old man who didn't care about fighting. Well, Owen definitely, for me, became the moral compass of the story. He is the he is the good heart that I am very disappointed that I killed. Um, uh, yeah, I, 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 he he's probably the character that I, I I loved the most out of Abby's story. I think I think in t- like apart from f- fucking Abby, he he is the one who did the least wrong. Yeah, I mean, out of the WLF, WLF, definitely. Mm. But I think um, I know. But I feel like in Abby's part of the story, like the moral compass, <coughs> well, not moral compass, but like the only real good is um, is it Yev? Lev, yeah. Lev, sorry. Um, Lev kind of felt like that for me. Interesting. Because, because they kind of grow, like because they start to swear and like they start to like yeah. take some of the Abby stuff. Well, Lev, Lev is Ellie. You know. Yeah. It's a, yeah. it's a parallel for what Ellie was to Joel. Um. And that sense of actual pure innocence this time round, but also like completely like has done and seen too much. Um, yeah, I think mean, it kind of feels like thinking about it now. It kind of feels like um, <clears throat> like Abby is like the, the, like it's kind of like the protective, kind of like carer echo of Joel in the story, mm. and Ellie is kind of like the like it's kind of like the violent. Um, what Abby, what, what, like what how Abby thinks of Joel as like that feels like yeah. the, the, like the echo of that. Ellie is that. In the, in the story, mm. like, they play off each other very well. And it, yeah, it's interesting because it is like what you're saying is that Abby only sees Joel as the man who ruined her life. Yeah. And Ellie only sees Abby and only wants to see Abby as the wo- the woman who's ruined her life. Because um, yeah. the game at core is all about matter of perspective and like 
truth and like humanity. Um, but yeah, you go through the sequence and you realize that you're going to have to go to this hospital to go and get these medical supplies. This was one of my favorite parts of the entire game. This hospital <laughs> sequence, because it's so creepy going through this ground zero infected area in the hospital and you're like, what is down here? <laughs> and then you've, you've got, you've got no infected for quite a long time and you fight some basic clickers and you're like, okay, maybe we're okay. Tell us. <laughs> you have this interaction with Nora before all of this, of course, which humanizes Nora quite a lot because you realize she's just a good friend of Abby's and she helps Abby get down to the lower levels of the hospital. You also see PS Vita girl here and you're like, oh, she's kind of cool. And you also see Bear, who's one of the dogs that you interacted with in the, in the kennels. And he's just like an old dog. And you're like, I killed him. Um, so you go down to these lower levels and it kind of sets you up by saying, this place was ground zero for the entire city. This is where they put all of the infected people when everyone started getting infected all those years ago. You go through. You can't find medical supplies. The stalkers have this new tactic where they get crusted into the walls and then pop out, which I think is disgusting and great. And it ruined my stealth several times of like, oh shit, I've just been caught because a stalker just like got crusty out of the wall. Um, you go, you finally find this ambulance in the parking lot. You open it up, you take out a health kit. It's got the supplies you need. Fellas, describe your feelings about this moment to me. <laughs> I know, um, it's like, I, I think I accidentally kind of ruined it myself because if you, cause if you go up to one of the doors that you can't go through and you just listen, you can actually see the outline of it. Oh, right, okay. Oh, really? so I, yeah, so I actually saw like the outline for it, like a you bit before. Yeah, so I, um, <laughs> it's just so disgusting. It's coming in like hair. <laughs> it's I'm horrific. <laughs> Carl, like, what did you feel? Because for me, absolutely. Absolutely gross. <laughs> Sorry, I, I thought Sorry. you were saying. For me, um, I thought it was a bloater. I, I had no idea yeah. that it was. I, I actually was like, had that. I had that. I was like, oh, there's going to be a bloater fight here now. Nope. And when I saw it, I was like, what the fuck? And I think it's it's interesting that they didn't just do a Resident Evil thing of like, oh, extra infected. I mean, it is a very Resident Evil moment. But it was also just like they give you story and, and and world context for why this thing exists down there. And then it starts chasing you. And I was like, oh, my God, this is fucking horrifying. And I remember not going through one of the doors because I wanted to just get a better look at what the fuck this thing was. And you kind of figure out it's a combination of like several different infected and like a bloater and a clicker all in one body. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you have this fight with it, which isn't a necessarily especially amazing fight, but it's just a cool moment because you're like, I want to kill this thing. What the fuck is this thing? Because part of me was like, oh, she's just going to like leave the hospital and leave this thing down here and maybe it'll like escape and cause uh, yeah, havoc I on really, the city. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I thought that. I thought it would come back later in the story and we'd be like, oh, for fuck's sake, why didn't we kill this thing? Mm. But seeing that for the first time, I, was, I, I, think, I think there was... There was actually one moment where I was playing it where I almost gagged. It was fucking disgusting. <laughs> it was absolutely vile. Imagine smelling that thing. Uh, mm. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you kill the fuck out of it. You, you, then... you know what? You know what? It reminded me of. So just going back a second. You know, have you, uh, inside. Yeah, oh, yeah. The thing yeah. that you become at the end of Inside. Yeah, I, no, I it really did. thought that. Like, and also, if you look at all these different arms. Yeah, and the model is like. Um, one of the stalkers is kind of like pulling out of the body and is, is using its hand to support the weight of the thing. And then obviously that thing detaches off of it and you have another fight with that in another room. Um, but this, I don't know, I think it was just the build-up of narrative of like expectation and then having a new type of infected, which we haven't had, you know, in The Last of Us at all so far. And then it being a big boss fight and also being a horrifying character design. It was just one of my favorite stretches of the game. Um, and whilst I actually think that a lot, of, some of Abby's section goes on a little bit too long or it could have been tightened up in parts, th this section I just really, really enjoy. And we shouldn't forget that also you have this big moment before this where Abby and Lev go through the skyscrapers and Abby has to sort of confront her fear of heights, which also does a really good job of humanizing her in my opinion. <laughs> Yeah, that's like I, like, I think the game is like, overall, it's a bit too long. 
Mm. Cause it's a bit saggy and I feel like um, the bit where we're going down through the hotel to get to the hospital and like bits before I felt like it could have been a bit shortened. Mm. But um but like but, but actually like climbing through like the um going over the construction stuff is really effective <laughs> and scary and, and, and good. And I th- and I think it was one of those moments as well that when you fall off the thing and into the swimming pool and Lev starts saying things like cold instead of cool and stuff. I was like, oh, fuck. I like this story. I like these characters. I'm invested, like, you know, I'm like, oh, shit. I like Ali. Yeah. Um, and also, I just think there's a diff. you know, I, I, I like the differences in, in Ali and Abby's loadout as well. And Abby gets this crossbow as well, which feels like a more sensible tool for this world. And also oh, just, I really one. like, yeah, I really like how it works. And also this, like, um, this old hunting pistol, which is like the most powerful thing in the game, but it's just really cool. It's just a really cool arsenal, and then you get flame for her later on. Um, but yeah, it's it's th- this this is day two of Abby's story, and then uh, you know Yara gets her arm cut off, and then and throughout this day, you you notice that Lev keeps talking about shaving his hair off, and talking about you know these seraphites are calling him by dead name whatever and um and you start to realize oh Lev, Lev is a trans character and honestly i don't know why people just think the inclusion of a trans character makes a game sgw garbage <laughs> because lev's character is so much more than the fact that he is trans and also yeah. it's so not his defining thing but also is so critical to his narrative in the game yeah, it ties into the character. It makes it makes sense. It makes a lot of sense for the character. Yeah, yeah. And um, you know, Yara sort of explains it to you a little bit, but they don't dwell on it too much. And like, they don't. They, it's not analyzed and like some political statement. It is just a character trait. It's just part of Lev's character. Um, I, I honestly, I, I have so much respect for Naughty Dog in what, in terms of what they do in, um, with diversity, and how much they take it seriously to just to just have those characters there and living, rather than making a point about them or, or trying to bring them for any particular reason. It's they're just there. I love <coughs> that. I love that from that company. Uh, I think it's something that Neil Druckmann was saying in some interviews is that it's not necessarily about forced diversity for them. It's more about by by having more diverse sets of characters, you end up with more interesting stories yeah. and more interesting narratives. Um, and I think you know, I don't look at this game as being a, a paragon of diversity, but it it kind of it it does a lot in that terms of how many different characters and ethnicities and backgrounds, mm. and it does create a more richer world and a more um, more interesting characters in the end. It was as opposed more real. To, yeah, yeah, as opposed to just seeing more Joels and Ellies. I don't know that I needed another rough Texan guy somewhere in this game. Yeah. Um, so then, at this point, Lev sneaks off um, to go to the island because they've all decided they're going to go take a... Uh, uh, Owen wants to leave the LWLF. Basically, Abby is on board. Mel doesn't want her there because she hates Abby for what she did to Joel. She, she thinks she's a horrible human being for what she did back in Jackson. Um, and then... Yeah, Lev has gone off to this island, and they've all—they're all convinced that they're going to take this boat to Santa Barbara, and Abby has decided that she's going to have to stay back because Mel doesn't want her there. Um, <clears throat> you go to this island, which at this point is clearly when Abby breaks into the uh, sorry, Ellie breaks into the aquarium and kills Owen and Mel. But you go to this island, which is one of my favorite. It's another one of my favorite segments of the game, probably my favorite stretch of the game. Yeah. is this island and this seeing this culture which has only sort of been muttered about and seeing how it is again it's just another safe haven for a different group it's just a different way of living and i think it's interesting as well that it's like one of the enemy groups is just like an evil group of amish people <laughs> <laughs> um what did you guys think about this section you know leading up to finding lev um i think <clears throat> i think it's just like I think because so much of the game is like old, um, <clears throat> it's like old buildings at least like 20, 20 plus years old. Yeah. With like concrete and metal and steel, you're just like running through. Mm. I think it's like, um, I think it's like, it's a massive change of pace to almost go back to like medieval times. 
of like because you know, everything's just wood and everything's like still new and more sustainable. Mm. And it's like a and um, yeah, it's it, 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 like it's also like just shows like how different like although like Jackson and um, and the stadium are quite similar, it also shows like different civilizations like can exist aren't just that as well outside of yeah. I just lo- I just love that they kind of brought in a group of people that had decided to go back to not not caveman era but pre modern man mm. sort of thing and ditch ditch the old world because I, I I I think there would be groups of people that decide to do that and decide that this isn't working let's do something different and see what we can build from yeah. from this so I, I I I loved investigating the island in that respect um, and 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 then I, th- I I just thought this whole section was a brilliant kind of allegory for what's going on in the world at the moment like the, the, the amount of um division that there are between groups uh, and and seeing it kind of play out in front of you and being on the outside of that hmm. but uh, yeah i thought that was a really good kind of commentary on it all i think it's interesting with the seraphite group as well and with lev as a character um go back to sort of diversity points is that it's not a simple you know our religion bad religion bad you know because Lev is still a, mm. quite a deeply religious character throughout the game he doesn't renounce mm. that faith and also like it's it's shown that the people the religion itself isn't bad these beliefs aren't bad it's just the way they're enforced and people twisting those words and and scriptures and stuff to yeah. fit their own needs which is something that happens in religion all the time yeah. um so you go through this section and then you find Lev and he has royally killed his fucking mum um, yeah. It's never a good moment. It's not a good gamer moment. No, heated gamer moment. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she she tried to stop him from playing Minecraft, and he was not about that. <laughs> um, so he kills his bum, but he was defending himself. And then you sneak off a little. Uh, also, there's this sequence where you're sneaking through like uh, like a cornfield or like plantation stuff. Okay. Which was which was great because all you've got to light the way is little flames and you can sort of see where people are, and then you like you like come out of the crops to grab someone and then snap their fucking neck and move through. I thought I just I just it just sticks in my mind imagery wise as like a really fun moment. Um, then you try and escape a little bit with Abby and Lev and Yara, and then boom, Yara gets fucking shot by a WLF member, wow. and and Abby <laughs> knocks the fuck out of him. Yeah. Then suddenly Isaac turns up, who we've met before, who is a guy who was in a lot of films and Westworld. And I recognise him from somewhere. I recognise the voice. I can give him a quick look up to see what he. Was. He was in Source Code. He was in uh, Shaft. He was in Westworld. He's in a lot of oh, Westworld. Things. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah. so. Um... Also, interesting fact, Carl, if you've seen Westwood, is Harry Gross, who was basically equal writer with Neil Druckmann on this game, was a, uh, a lead writer on Westworld. And so a, a, quite, quite a yeah. few... Yeah. Quite oh, it was few, Jeffrey Wright? Yeah. I didn't realise it was Jeffrey Wright. Oh, that's sick, I love Jeffrey it. Wright. Yeah. And he's, playing, um, and he's playing um, Commissioner Gordon. Yes, he is in the new yeah. Batman movie. Yeah, he's great. I love Jeffrey Wright. That's Jeffrey Wright, it's Isaac. All right, I didn't realise that. Uh, okay. Yeah, because the face is obviously different in the game, so I was like, I can't quite recognise mm. his voice. Yeah. But there, there you go. Brilliant. I didn't um, so that happens, and then Isaac comes out of nowhere, and Abby is sort of protecting Lev, and is saying, you know, don't... don't and, and he's saying, move out of the way, Abby, and Abby's like, I'm not going to move. Um, and then I'm, I'm pretty sure it's safe to assume Isaac dies in this moment, because Yara grabs a pistol off the ground and shoots him. Mm. Meaning that Yara wasn't dead. And then all of these WLF members just empty their magazines on her on the floor. And you jump through this building with Lev. And Lev kind of says to you, you know, with blood on his hands, he's like, you, your people did that. Your people killed her. And, and Abby turns to him and is like, no, you're my people. Mm. Because, she, you know, she's clearly done with the WLF. She realises how ridiculous it was and also just preying on her anger this whole time, preying on her anger for revenge that she that they've turned her into a soldier, they've turned her into a, mili- mil- a militant person. Um, and then you get to the moment which I was waiting for the whole game where you start fighting the WLF members as Abby. 
and it's, it's kind of nasty because they always react to you being Abby. They always say it's Abby. She's she's siding with the Seraphites or like they every every WLF member you interact with or, or grab in a chokehold has an interaction with Abby. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and then this also leads into the section we were talking about where you're sneaking through the grass, um, or you can choose to engage in the combat with Lev to get out of this island, which this, 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 this stretch of the game, I already said is one of my favorite parts of the game, but it's also just the visuals of this sort of like idyllic kind of beautiful village and island being burnt to the ground and constant firefights and just caught in the middle of that. It feels a lot like a commentary on just the violence in the game and also just tribalism in general. And it was just weird crawling through the grass and choosing not to engage in the fight. It was like this is so fucking pointless. Yeah. What are they it's, fighting over? Just people are going to die for no reason. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you st you still have to kill a few people there, but for the majority of it, you can just sneak through the grass and sneak yeah. out the other side. Um, and then you get this awesome fight against this another brute guy while the village is burning down around you. Abby loses all of her guns and supplies. And um, and at this point, I was like, oh, this is what they've been training me for with the dodge and punch mechanic. This is what they've been training me for, so I could do this boss fight without a tutorial. And so you're dodging this guy, and you beat the shit out of him, and then Abby, like, cuts a side in his fucking face. And he's still going. <laughs> and he's just, like, groaning the rest of the game, the rest of the, the fight, sorry. And then he just takes so much beating and you think he's dead and then you, you go to strike him and he grabs you again and pushes you off the side. And the way you finally finish him off is she, she grabs his fucking jaw and you're like, oh God, no. This jaw that she's just ripped open and then pulls the arrow out of his body and stabs him to fucking death with it. It's nasty. It's a great <laughs> little encounter. Yeah. It's a, it's, it's one of the best parts of the game. <laughs> that, was, that, that was the most horrifying part of the game. I was disgusted. Jesus Christ! <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 that guy is dead. <laughs> like he's, probably, he's, he's, dead, he's dead. dead. He's extra he's dead. dead. Yeah. Um, and then you make your way to the boat with Lev, and you know, supposedly all is good. Um, something I found out that was interesting in the concept art of the game is a lot of the Abbey sections. Uh, Ellie was originally meant to be there as well. Like Ellie was meant to be on the island for some other reason in the original scripts and stuff. Right. Because um, apparently in the original version of the story, each of their stories was five days long as opposed to three. But I feel like if the game was any longer, it probably would not have hit. <laughs> no, I don't think <laughs> it would have dragged longer. Yeah. yeah. Um, but you get back to the aquarium, supposedly everything's good. Boom, Owen's dead. Abby is not happy. Finds Ellie's map that she accidentally dropped. You sneak in through that window in the theatre, which I thought was funny, because when I played that section as Ellie, I was like, that's really dumb. Anyone could just sneak in through the, through the window. And then, boom, you're sneaking in the window as Abby. Oh, and this section of the game is where I feel like it all starts to culminate, and it all starts to become the clearer picture of neither of these people are in the right. In neither of them deserves to die and I hated this section of the game but I also think it's brilliant I hated it because I didn't want to do it but you break in you kill Jesse Ellie gives herself up then you shoot Tommy supposedly killing him but apparently just paralyzing him a little bit and blinding him and then you have a boss fight with Ellie yeah <laughs> You have a David-style boss fight with Ellie, except I think it's a lot more well done in this one. Like, there's actually environments to go through, and like you can throw a bottle at her or distract her with noises and stuff. And she'll like, but she'll put down proximity bombs and things. More fleshed out for sure, yeah. Yeah. Um, how did you guys feel when you realised, oh fuck, this is a boss fight against Ellie? I don't know. I was just like, I really don't want to hurt Ellie like no. at all. <laughs> but I don't want to do this. Yeah. yeah same. The whole the whole time you're like sneaking up on her, you just you, you don't want to press the button. You don't, no. want to do that. and like uh, it, it it's scary seeing how much of a killing machine she's become mm. as well. 
It really, and, uh, yeah. seeing it from that perspective really makes you go, neither of these people are, are, should be doing this. Neither of these people are good people. Mm. Uh, and I think it's only through Abby's eyes that you'd see that. If you were playing as Ellie, you'd be like, yeah, I'm Ellie, let's go. But you um, also see what, how ruthless a killing machine Ellie is and like yeah. how it must be when you're on the other side of her, mm. you know, just being this violent thing. But I was also unsure of how this was going to play out because it almost felt like this was the end of the game. Yeah. And it also was like, I'd also seen leaks that Ellie apparently died by Abby's hand. I thought she was going to die in this. Like, I was like, like side bread leak fun. saying that. Yeah. Can, I, can I just say the amount of times I got Abby's face sh shot with the shotgun was hilarious. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, me, on, me on the ground, shot in the stomach and then getting shot in the face by Ellie. Great. Loved it. <laughs> it was nasty. The death animations in this game are horrible. Yeah. Um, especially just running up to Ellie and then she like machetes you to death. Um, but yeah, you play this fight out, it starts on the upper floors and then Avi hits her so hard against the ground that they fall through into the basement of the theatre. And it's kind of a creepy environment and you're also just this sense of, I don't want to do this. I was like, I just go home. Both of you just go home because this is not going to end well. Anyway, you keep going, and then they make you mash X to beat the fuck out of Ellie, and you snap both, she snaps her arm, which was just, no, 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 stop, and then beats her face in so much. And then the worst part about it was Dina coming in. Yeah. Um, and she smashes Dina's face against the floor, and Dina is knocked out, and you're like, oh, God. And then she goes to slit her throat, and this is one of the most, like, kind of disturbing lines in the game for me, is Ellie's like, don't kill her, she's pregnant. And Abby looks at her and gets ready and she's like, good. And then the only reason she doesn't do it is because Lev stops her. Yeah. How did you guys feel at this moment? You know, you've just beat the fuck out of both Ellie and Dina. Despite it being so brutal and so, so horrible to watch, I really, really thought that her not killing um, Dina was going to be the small act of love that started the the, the process of healing. Mm. Um, so in that brief moment, I was actually fucking relieved. Um, but but you, you're actually right in that, Carly, though, because if she had killed Dina, there is no way Ellie would have let Abby live. No, not at all. Yeah. So in, in, that, in that way that a, a sort of selfless act can beget another one, she did make the right choice. Um, Harry, how did you feel after this boss fight? I know, um, like, uh, it's, it's weird, for the boss fight, it felt like very gamey in a lot of ways. Mm. Almost like, it like, almost kind of hampered the emotions in a few ways. But no, I mean, like, it's still like a really great scene. Um, and it's also like, it's also like, it's, it's when Lev turns up, it's like, it's like a sigh of relief. I think yeah. he left out, because like, oh, I think like, Ellie's probably okay. And I think like, Abby is saying good for that. Uh, it's saying good to um, Athena being pregnant. It's, it's, <laughs> it's like so cold that it makes like, yeah. so much sense for it's her. Poor, because also she's it's just killed a pregnant woman on her side. Mel, yeah, because El, Ellie killed um, Mel. Yeah. Like, uh. One of the interesting things that I think is flawed about some of the yeah. arguments against this game is that um, people saying that Ellie loses everything and Abby loses nothing. And it's like, oh, have you cool. played the cool. fucking game? <laughs> Abby has not only lost her dad, which was what Ellie lost in Joel, but she has lost everybody else she cared about, the only person she's ever really felt in love with, and like her entire life and culture and like group. And, and now all she has left is Lev. Yeah. That is it. I, I don't understand how people can say that Abby lost nothing in this game. Yeah, I don't, I don't get that. <laughs> but I think as well, you know, it's that same decision between Abby killing Dina out of anger and Ellie killing Abby at the end out of anger. It's by not doing that, you still get to hold on to a little bit of your humanity because you made the right choice in that moment. Yeah. And Abby walking off and saying, I don't ever want to see you again. It cuts to black. And honestly, part of me was like, our credit's going to start rolling right now. Our credit's going to start rolling right now. Is like, is that it? Is they've made their statement, the game's over, that's it. Then you get the farm. Yeah, and, and I thought the game was going to end on the farm. Yeah. Yeah. How, 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 I, 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 was in, I was reminded so much of the ending of Uncharted 4. Yeah. 
and how it felt like warmth suddenly and like everything was okay and everything was perfect and part of me was conflicted because I was like I want more game because this is Last of Us 2 and I've been playing I've been waiting for years but also stop and this needs to end here and you have that that moment of um Ellie and JJ sitting on the tractor and looking at the sunset and I was like credit's gonna start now it's going to start now I, I was honestly like I at all points throughout that section I was like I'm 10 seconds away from the credits at any yeah. given moment and I think it's it's actually an interesting way that they've done that because it means that when you when she leaves that behind you feel a bit more of that no we could have had a nice ending we could have had a good a good finale to all of this and you've thrown that away Ellie um yeah, what were your guys' thoughts during this farm section? I, I want to share a thought that a friend of mine had, actually. I, like, while, while they were walking around with JJ in their arms, they kind of experienced the PTSD that um, Ellie experiences later on in the farm, in that every, every door that they walked through, they were like, I'm holding a kid, I don't want, to, I don't want an infected to come upon me, I don't want that sort of thing. Uh, mm. They hadn't quit from the game it was it, it, it like it was warmer but they didn't necessarily detach from the the violence and the things i, that I think sam before, said to me that he I was found ex- interesting yeah i think sam said to me that he was expecting abby to pop up right or something like it just felt like mm-hmm. it wasn't it felt like it felt too good um and then you get these really cute moments where ellie and, and dina are dancing together and they're a really good couple and I think this. I don't know how long do you guys reckon this was after the end of the events in Seattle. I think six months. I think like six, like as JJ is clearly like a yeah, six, baby, yeah. six months or so. I think. Hmm. Yeah. It's a good amount of time. I was thinking maximum of like a year. Yeah. But I, I think I think it, you're probably right because you know Tommy is still holding on to it as well. But yeah, everything sort of feels a bit too good to be true. And I was thinking it's going to end cut to black at any moment. And then boom, you're in the, you're herding sheep and you're in the, the, the cab, the cabin, the barn, sorry. And it cuts to black. And then suddenly she's back at the stairways just before Joel dies. And honestly, playing that at two o'clock in the morning freaked me the fuck out. (laughs) It really freaked me out with headphones on and just like, going from that warmth to suddenly Joel screaming while getting killed and you're in darkness. I was just like, I don't like this. I don't like this at all. And then she can't get through the door to save him. It's horrible. And also part of me for a nanosecond was like, wait, was that, was that all a dream? Was that yeah. just like Ellie about to say she's not going to go after it because she knows what's going to happen? Anyway, I'm glad it wasn't because I feel like if Naughty Dog ever did a it was whole. It was all a dream thing. It would. It would, it would always. It would. No matter how well they did it, it would be so cheap. Um. How did you feel when you realize? You know, Tommy shows up, and then you. You. He sort of leaves this. Uh, this map, and he. He knows where. Uh, where Ellie is. How, uh, Abby is. How did you feel that Tommy was still alive? I felt a bit cheap seeing Tommy alive because I felt like someone being shot in the head is quite feels quite definitive. As a method of death in media, or saying that he's alive, <coughs> like it, 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 like I can understand why he's still alive. I'm mean, like narratively, mm. but um, I feel like it could have been like expanded a bit, like even just a few more lines of dialogue, just talking about like about why he's back at the farm, why he, why, like why he's at that farm. Maybe it would have helped the scene mm. a bit, but like it's still like. I mean, he's just, I mean, he's basically just had to set the rest of the game in motion for yeah. an hour or two. I mean, it was weird for me because I still, I think I was starting to have the grief of Joel being dead set in. And at the end, I was like, someone's here. Is Joel still alive? Is Joel back? Is there, you know, even though I know it's not possible. But then again, it being Tommy still being alive still felt like there's still a little bit of Joel left. There's still a little bit of that connection to an older life that's left for Ellie. Um, yeah. And then you can play the guitar. And the whole game, even up until this point, because I thought the game was about to end, I was like, we still haven't seen that cutscene of the dance between Ellie and Dina, which was the first thing we saw in gameplay yeah. in 2018. I remember, because me and Carl, I saw it live. He was at my flat. We did. The first, we the first ever gameplay for this game and that trailer, we watched it together live at two o'clock in the morning. And I remember that. 
And I was like, where yeah. is where is that? What a journey that's been. It has been quite day. quite a journey, yeah. Um, and then suddenly Ellie plays the guitar after not being able to sleep because she's clearly got PTSD with Joel. And boom, you're in that barn scene. Um, and it was interesting because for me, part of, there's a there's a note in her journal where she says the last things I ever said to Joel are like echoing in my mind. And then you you're never quite sure what the last thing she ever said to him was until the very end of the game. And so you have this barn scene, and it's a bit more expanded than the one they showed at E three, of Joel trying to interrupt. And then the last thing, well, the thing she says to him is like, "I don't need your help or anything." And as a player, for me, I was like that's the last thing she said to him. Yeah. And it suddenly felt like horrifying and like unfinished and like, that's the last thing she ever got to say to him. Um, what were your thoughts at this point? Did you feel like it, maybe this was going to start going even further? I don't know. It kind of like, I felt a little bit gutted <laughs> just mm. with how like, um, like how, although it turns out it's not a final words to him, like it's not the last time we spoke. But like feeling like it was that, mm. like for like an hour or so, I was like this, <laughs> just too sad. And um, but I but but I kind of felt like at that point, like this is probably going to keep on going for a bit longer. Mm. And I also felt like I feel like Abby was going to get some kind of follow up at that point. So I knew that it was going to go a bit further on. But yeah, Carlo, I was actually still <clears throat> really unsure because I part part of me thought that they would leave us with a very bitter taste in our mouth. For, for for the purposes of the, the themes of the story, which I mean, they kind of did <laughs> anyway. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, they did. They did anyway. But like at this point, it would have been worse because you had the unfinished um, thing going on with Joel. You got uh, do I still go after Abby? Um, running on in your mind. You've got this PTSD. Life is shit. I mean, it's still shit at the end of the game, but life is abysmal. abysmal. But the thing is, life is it. life is still good for her. Like she's got everything she's ever wanted, and the thing she's scared about most is being alone. Mm. And it's like, it's, I know she's struggling with PTSD, but she just can't let go. Yeah, she just can't do it. Oh, she's also not willing to try and do it, or to try and forgive Abby. She just doesn't want to try. She wants to just. She she thinks that killing Joel will just get rid of those memories. In the same way that Abby thought killing sorry, she thinks that killing Abby will get rid of those memories. In the same way that Abby thought that killing Joel would get rid of the memories of, of her dad dying, of seeing her dad's dead body. Um, anyway, Ellie can't sleep, gets up in the middle of the night, goes downstairs and starts packing. She's wearing Joel's jacket, I don't know yeah. if you noticed that. Um, and she's packing up, ready to go, and Dina comes down. And at this point, I was like, I feel like this still might end here. I feel like the ending right here might be that Ellie decides not to go. And it's another one of those, like, okay moments from the first game. It's like you're just left in the middle of a conversation. And then she doesn't. And part of me was so excited because I was like, oh my God, how is this going to end? But another part of me was like, you have definitely, definitely, definitely made the wrong choice here, Ellie. Then we cut to Santa Barbara, Abby and uh, Lev, and suddenly you're in control of Abby. Um, what were you thinking at this point? You know, you're, you're in control of Abby again in, in sunny California. I really didn't know where like I really didn't know where like where exactly it was gonna go next. Mm. Yeah. And it's kinda of like because I feel like the like, last like bit was so like emotionally intense. You're just kinda of, like walking around this neighborhood in California for like ten minutes. It's quite it's almost relaxed. It's a palette cleanser, really. Yeah. And you find a few notes and things and, yeah. and Carla, I think you and me had the exact same experience, um, in that I was playing through, I think it was from like Abbey Day 2. I played through all of that up until the farm because I, and it was late in the morning. And I was like, I'm just going to keep playing because I can feel I'm very close to the end. I can feel I'm very close to the end. Then you get to the farm and you're like, okay, it's fine. It's going to end any second. And when it kept going, as soon as I got to Santa Barbara's Ellie, I was like, okay, I'm turning off for tonight because there's still <laughs> more game to go. And it was a hard thing because it was like, I, I want to, exactly. yeah, I want to keep playing. Because I want to see how this ends, but also like it's so late. I'm gonna just stop there for a minute. Um, and then obviously, Abby and Lev do find uh, contact for the fireflies in uh, what's it called? Claire. 
Claranetta Island or something? Something like that, yeah. Oh, I sent it to Carla yesterday. Catalina Island is where they find the Firefly contact. Um, and you're like, oh shit, there is, there is hope for these characters. There is a group out there that they could supposedly go to as long as they're still there or whatever. And then as you come out, what I was expecting was a hit to come from Ellie. I was expecting Ellie to be right outside. Mm -hmm. and it was going to be boom. And no, there's a whole new group of these rattlers. And you're like, what the fuck are these people about? Because they're like, well, don't kill her now. Like, we still need to use her. Um, yeah. And then that boomer punches love. Yeah. <laughs> punches him right in the face and his head knocked into the garage. That punch. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but it was at that point I was like, okay, I really don't fucking know where this is going to end. Yeah. And that's why I stopped playing. And then you, you sort of assume control as Ellie. And I, I, I know this isn't that long after the events of Seattle, but for me, her being on the farm as like a mother and her being here, it felt like she was now a fully grown woman. Right. It, it, to me, it felt like she was older. Like she was aged a lot by everything that happened in Seattle. She didn't seem like a teenager anymore. Interesting, because mm. I actually uh, like I, I agree with you in that sense. Like when she goes on the road to Santa Barbara, she is a woman at that point. But I thought throughout the rest of the game, up until the point on the farm, she'd gotten younger and younger for me, because she's more susceptible to her own emotions mm. until the very end. I, I don't know. There's, there's just something about that that felt quite kind of childish to a certain degree. I get, I get what you mean, you know what but I, mean? I think, I think for me, she felt older because it was like, I think she was getting more and more aware of how she knew she wasn't making the right choice. It, yeah. She becomes more and more self-aware mm. of that. She knows this is wrong and she knows that she shouldn't have gone to Santa Barbara, but she just can't let it go. Um, yeah. So anyway, you get to Santa Barbara. I was blown away at this point. And it was at this point that the game sort of entered another echelon in my brain of like, I was liking it a lot until this point, and now it's blown me away with the scale, with like the scale of this story, um, and the scope of it as a whole, and how much effort they put into it, and and how much how much dedication they put into making this story pay off. And then you get a submachine gun, which is epic, which is really really good at New Game Plus. Just yeah. let you know. <laughs> um, and you start fighting these rattlers, and she gets ambushed. Essentially, she gets ambushed and caught, or she gets stabbed in the fucking side. And another part of me again was like, "Is it's going to end here? It's going to end here of like she shouldn't have come in the first place." Um, and then the rattler tries to tries to let her down, and then make her the clicker bite her hand, and she manages to get out of it um, and, and kill both of them. Um, did did any of you figure out what the Rattlers' deal was? Because to me, it looked like they were keeping people as slaves, but I couldn't. Figure yeah, out. some kind of human yeah. slavery thing. Yeah. That's what yeah. I figured. Yeah. Because I was watching a podcast, and someone said that they found a note that um, they infect they were basically infecting people deliberately as like protection, which you find a few of in the camp, yeah. and then they were using extra prisoners as as fee as food for the for the infected. All right. <laughs> apparently there's a note somewhere in the resort, but that was their deal. It's like they had slaves, but it was also like they were keep they were making sure they always had people to keep as infected as guard. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, you make your way through. Ellie sort of stitches herself up a little bit. You're killing these rattlers, and uh, she finds this image of the rattlers insignia, and she puts it in a notebook, and she sort of says, "Fireflies, hunters, all these other like fuck all of these groups." Um, I think that's another part of the tribalism is like, it's why I don't think there will ever be a need for a sequel to this game. Because mm. what else can you show us apart from in every part of this world, right? Ellie found like Utopia and there is nothing more out there. Maybe there's the Firefly for Levin um, Abbey, but every part of this world, there's going to be infected. There's going to be hunters of some sort, rattlers, WLF, Seraphites. The fireflies in some instances it's all the same um and all of that tribalism and all of that killing is so pointless and it was just another note from her notebook that i was like thinking about it again but you play through and you go through the uh, resort 
and it's a very action heavy segment or at least a, a lot of killing is done by my my playthrough of Ellie yeah. and, you, and, and you're not really thinking about these guys as enemies anymore and I think that's sort of a testament as well to what Ellie's going through in this moment of like she doesn't really care about them she's just here to get through she just wants to find Abby she, they, at this point none of it matters to her and she frees the prisoners and they say that Abby's hung up on the pillars and again I was like where is where is this going and then you see Abby and what was your guys initial reactions to seeing to seeing Abby hung up on this pillar it was, it, it, cutting her down and letting her go. I was I was so ready for us to go off in those boats in different pers- directions, um, but I knew that that wasn't going to be the case, and that's what yeah. hurt me most. Uh, and I was just like, I was wait- you, you're kind of waiting for the point where Ellie's like, okay, what are you, gonna, how are you going to do this? Like, what's what's happening here? And it, it, it just hurt me more and more. Like, I could feel tears wear- welling up even as we make that walk to the beach because. <laughs> No, don't fucking do it. There's, there's no point. Just mm. let it go. It really Harry, hurt. what did you feel when you saw what has happened to Abby? Well, I mean, because like, I mean, like, it's also like saying like her muscles, like, like, because like, because her muscles so present throughout so much of the game, and when she's hung up, they're like, like still there, but like they're so much smaller. Like she feels so much like physically weaker. I didn't recognize her <clears throat> at first. I yeah, also yeah. she had the head shape. They've they've cut her hair off and um. <laughs> I was just like, oh fuck, she's been through so much. Yeah, she's clearly suffered enough. And you know, you're walking towards the boats, and I, I also was thinking the same thing, Carly. That like, she's gonna let, you know, she's gonna let them go because clearly you can see that this is pointless. Um, and then she suddenly, Ellie suddenly gets a flash of Joel, Joel's smashed head open on the floor. And, you're, and she's like, we're going to fight. And, you know, it's like, it's so pointless because Abby is even being like nice to her. She's like saying, you know, the boats are over here. You know, it's not this, it, it's just like, I don't think we're going to fight, right? Abby's just like, <laughs> straight up, I'm not going to do this. Yeah. And yeah. Ellie grabs her and throws her in the water. And she's like, I'm not going to fight you. And then Ellie threatens Lev, of all people. And it's like, oh my god, Ellie is the villain in this scenario, man. You're not, there is nothing, I mean, there's no hero and villains in this game, but in this exact scenario, Ellie is definitely doing the most selfish, evil thing that she could possibly do. Threatening Lev so that she can get a good fight out of Abby. Because she doesn't just want to kill her, she wants to get a good fight out of her. Yeah, she wants to earn it. Yeah. Yeah. And so you get the most, I, I, it's so weird for me but it makes so much sense that i was so flawed by this ending fight and it's not like a technical masterpiece or anything especially it is just so much narrative build up and so much context to what's happening it's such a pointless sad angry chaotic fight between two very bloody hurt upset women in the middle of the ocean and also, I don't know, did you guys have a moment where you realised that those boats were the, the main menu? Yeah, screen? I noticed that, yeah. yeah. I was like, oh, it's, like, it's, it's when you first go over the hill and you see it, you're like, oh, that's it, isn't it? Yeah, it's coming full circle, and it was like, this is the end. And mm-hmm. I wasn't, I, I'd sort of seen online that people were complaining that Abby got to live, but I still wasn't sure whether or not Ellie was going to, obviously before I played this, I still wasn't sure whether or not Ellie was going to live, or whether that was actually true or what, you know. So I'm playing this fight and I'm like, stop, stop, go home, stop, stop this right now. And it's just as soon as Ellie threatens Lev, uh, Abby doesn't think twice. She's boom, back into combat, back into fighting because you you fucked with her. Um, What did you guys think of this fight? Just so bloody and like, uh, because, because my mum walked up the stairs when I was doing it, and she said, that sounds violent. <laughs> just because I had the door open uh, quite loud. Just went, that sounds really violent, Harry. <laughs> She's just not like, wrong. So like, yeah, and just blood. And it's like constant, just stabbing. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Carly? I, sa- I said to you that um, the game unfortunately glitched out a little bit at this point, like at, at the edges of the, like, the combat zone. Uh, Abby would kind of verge into my body at points, but oh. <laughs> that, that aside, um, 
this. I just, every single press of Square, I just didn't want to do it. Mm. Just didn't want to do it. And, and I really do think it's a testament to their storytelling abilities to get me to that place before Ellie's got there. Um, uh, well, I know. I think you're in the same place as she is. I don't think she, she thinks it's the right thing to do. No, yeah, she yeah, th- yeah, she yeah, feels yeah. like she has to do it to live. Mm. Um, but yeah, you have this fight and you're dodging attacks and you slowly see Abby more bloody and stabbed in the arm. And like, then, you, then you get rid of the knife and it's just two people fighting with fists, completely drenched in blood and like crying and like grou- screaming in pain. Um, and yeah, Abby is just like sunburn and bleeding and she stops, she stops blocking your attacks. And then you get her on the ground and you strike and just strangling her under the water. And I was like, oh, Lev's going to save her. And I was like, nope. Oh, he's not coming. And she's strangling Abby and strangling Abby. And part of me was, I'm still not sure how I feel about this ending because there's different. And so I think this is the best ending and it makes the most sense. But part of me was just like, kill her then. Just kill her so that you'll be done with it. Like, because I can't, like, just kill her then, fine. But then, but also, like, I don't want Abby to die. I don't want Abby to get hurt at all. I love <laughs> Abby as a character. But it was like, fuck it then, just kill her. Like, do it. I was angry with Ellie. And then, yeah. and then when she doesn't do it, I was sort of relieved. I was also like, okay, well, I hope you can get over this. But it's that interesting thing that she gets a, um, she gets a flashback of Joel for the first time in ages where it's not his broken head. It's of him, you know, a memory where she remembers trying to forgive him. Yeah. Um, and she lets her go. And obviously, let's not forget that Abby bites her fucking fingers off, which is just the most horrible part of this whole fight. I mean, it's just like so nasty. And then she lets she lets Abby go off. And honestly, again, of that imagery of the boat of Abby's boat drifting off from distance, um, and the look that Ellie's giving her with like tears in her eyes, and it's like this look of like, I'm not sure whether I even made the right choice just then. I'm not sure what I'm doing, but it's like deep down she's still a good person somewhere in there, and yeah. she knows that she shouldn't do this. Um, and also by doing that, she's able to hold on to it, like Abby de Medina, she's able to hold on to a little bit of her humanity. Um, I, I don't know about you guys, but as that boat's going away and you were seeing this imagery of Ellie against all this fog, I was like, it's going to cut to credits right now. I was thinking that, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm glad it didn't, though. Because the next scene of the game, um, the thinking about it makes me tear up. I'm thinking about it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because you get back to the fu- what the fuck is happening to me? I'm thinking about it. I'm My voice is cracking up. Um, you go back to the farmer's alley, and she's lost her fingers. Yeah. And you go into the house, and Dina is gone, and everything is gone. And you go upstairs, and she picks up the guitar that Joel gave her, and she can't play it. And it's this gameplay moment that you've been able to do the whole game through and now she just can't physically do it. It doesn't work. Um, And then it flashes back to Joel and her on the porch in, I'm trying not to be hyperbolic, but one of the most beautiful scenes I think I've experienced in a video game. And just like, I can't, I can't think of another game, another scene in life in anything that I can just think about that always makes you want to cry. I'm actually crying right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they have a conversation and, you know, they have a normal back and forth and Joel talks about drinking coffee. And then Ellie sort of confronts him again about the Firefly thing. And yeah. she says, I don't know if I can ever forgive you, but I'd like to try. And that's sort of her way of saying, I love you. <laughs> And um, and Joel starts crying. Joel starts crying because he realizes that how much she loves him and how much hurt he's caused. But then he says that amazing line as well of um, if if the Lord gave me another chance to 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 change my okay. choice, I'd do it all over again. Yeah, and I think also kind of changed because I think playing the first game again, I realized I was like, this is just a selfish action, but it's also like. It's like an action of love. <laughs> yeah. 
which I don't and, think and he would about. never lose another daughter. How could he yeah. ever lose his daughter again? Um, and if I ever if I ever were to lose you, I'd surely lose myself. And that's what happened with Joel, is he lost himself after losing Sarah, and he would have lost himself again, and his life would have been pointless without Ellie in it. Yeah. And for Ellie, it's the same thing. If she lost herself in this cycle of vengeance, she lost herself in her actions, and because she lost Joel. Um, but yeah, he says that line of "I do it, I do it all over again." And it, it, uh, I saw a beautiful, I hate that it was just a tweet, but I saw a tweet that was like, for me, the point was that Ellie wanted to have a meaningful death, but Joel wanted her to have a meaningful life. Yeah. Joel wanted her to live her life and to be alive. And it was like, for him, it didn't matter what he had to do to get there because all that mattered was the girl was still alive. She's still, she's still here. Um, and while I was playing it, I was sobbing. And I was doing a proper face, and I was like, oh God, oh God. And just seeing Joel cry, and I was like, are they going to... Apparently in the original version of the cutscene, they hugged, but they took that out because it felt more realistic. Um, and the last thing she ever says to him was, see you around. Yeah. And it feels a lot nicer, but then you you come back to present Ellie, and you're just like, oh, man. And she can't play the guitar anymore. She's lost that connection to Joel. And so rather than trying to reclaim it, rather than trying to take all of her stuff, which Dina has very clearly shoved all into that room to say like, I'm gone. Yeah. I'm not taking this with me. Ellie just leaves it all. And at first I was incredibly depressed about this ending because I was like, it, it, she's left with nothing and she can't even connect with Joel anymore. But as I think about it more and more, it becomes more about, um, I don't know about your guys' interpretation, but more about her choosing to leave vengeance and choosing to leave Joel behind so that yeah. she can move on from it. <clears throat> Felt like that. So I kind of think it, it definitely feels like that. And I'm hoping, <clears throat> like I don't know how like, likely it is, I kind of like to think that Ellie does go back to Jackson mm. and does live with Dina. But yeah. Well, I think if, as well as she's thinking about that idea of forgiveness, then maybe she's hoping that Dina will be able to forgive her in the same way. Um, yeah. Apparently in one of the original versions of the ending, Ellie picks up the, the soft toy off of the tractor again before it cuts to credits, implying that she does go back to Jackson. Um, right. Mm. But also, like, Ashley Johnson, who plays Ellie, says that she thinks that she just goes off to live on her own and just try and confront her demons and try and confront her fears for a bit. Carlo, what did you feel? I mean, I know how you felt, because you called me straight after you finished the game, and you were a fucking I was, mess. I was a mess. I was in tears. I was you sobbing. You were sobbing. I couldn't get a sentence out of you. <laughs> um, yeah, I've been thinking about it a lot. Uh, I, yeah, I can't stop thinking about the ending. It's, it's it, it the past. I mean, when did I finish? I finished on Tuesday, so what four or five days. I've just kind of been living in that moment to a certain extent. Like I, I don't want to leave the world of the Last of Us. Mm. I don't. I don't want to leave Ellie on that note. Um, and I, I hope. I hope to God that she goes and does, um, something to get to reclaim some part of her life back. But I don't. I don't think she does. I. Yeah, I do think she goes off and becomes a hermit. And, and... She walked away with her humanity, though. She walked away yeah, with a little bit something. of it left. And, and she, she has been in such a dark place that now she needs to start heading towards light. Um, and something that I don't think was actually implied by the creatives, but something a point that someone brought up in the podcast I was listening to, they were saying that the two different sides of it is that Ellie is a moth, right? She has the moth on her arm and she has the moth on her guitar and Abby is a firefly. So Abby is inherently full of light and can find it when she needs it. Whereas Ellie will drift away from it, but will always try and come back to it as a moth. Like will always gravitate towards trying to go back towards the good. Um, right. And that may just be reading too far into things, but I thought that was a nice little analogy. I, um, I think this game exceeds my expectations, exceeded my expectations of what, oh, this, definitely. of what this game could be. 
because the reason I was excited was I was like, oh, cool, a really violent, naughty dog game about revenge. And it gave me so much more than that. And I'm, I'm yeah. still holding on to it being possibly the best experience I've had from a piece of art. Because wow. you go through so many emotions and you come up with such revelations that I, I don't think it's possible in any other medium. Will be it will be interesting to see what happens to the the, the TV series that they're making. Um, but it, it was honestly amazing, incredible work. Yeah, I would I wouldn't say it's I wouldn't put it that highly. <laughs> Um, <laughs> like I still like really love the. I think it's my favorite Naughty Dog game. Mm. Like I really love the game still. Um, I know um, it's the most I've cared about a game story, like since Red Dead Two. Mm -hmm. Sure, me. Carl, um, you used to play Red Dead Two, you dickhead. <laughs> yeah, I know, one. but I left it back in Sid Cup, and I can't oh. grab it. So you should, you should you should very much play that one. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's the most I've cared about a game story in a while. Um, and I, I think, like, because it goes through so much, and I do think the game's a bit, like, I don't, I, I, like, I like the ending, but I think it is, like, too long and a bit saggy at points. Mm. I think if it was, like, two, three hours shorter, I, I think it would have been a bit nicer overall. But, um, but I think in terms of the story, and how it tells that story, it does it very, very effectively. And I think it's very good. Very, very good. Yeah. Yeah. Did did it sort of exceed your expectations, Harry, and what you thought the game was gonna be? Uh yeah. I think it's um I mean I went in because I was like because I I mean I played the first game again uh, and I and I uh, and I was kind of reminded of how good the first game is because I haven't played it in like over five years. Hmm. I first got my PS4 and playing and playing the first one again. I was just like, oh yeah, this is really really good. And um, and I think I kind of leveled and and, and um, I kind of think that leveled my expectations. That really really good. I think it ex still exceeded that so much. And I think and I think it exceeded that with Abby yeah. and all her stuff and all like because she came, I think she's my favorite character in the whole game. Mm. And I think it's just I think if she wasn't in the game or if her role was different, I don't think I think it would be a much worse. A much less interesting mm. thing. I think, yeah, I was saying to you, Harry, that I'm so glad they took this direction yeah. rather than another safe Joel and Ellie story. Mm. Because yeah. this is, you said the point that this is going to age so much better than anything that would have been safe to do. Mm -hmm. um, do you do you guys buy into the sort of narrative that's coming with a, some like game journalist at the moment? That's you know, stating that this is sort of elevating. Um, the power of like narrative and video games, it elevates what we sort of experienced before. Definitely. I think this is very unique in the way that it tells its story and the way that it uses um, the platform, like the, 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 the form, um, to subvert your expectations and, and, and give you things to think about. Like forcing, a, forcing the players into a decision that they don't necessarily want to do uh, and uh, who you're playing at, all, all of those sorts of things that they were playing with. It, this is the only game that I've, I've seen do in that capacity, I think. Mm. Right. I mean, I'm not as avid a gamer as you guys, but... <laughs> um, I, I, don't, I don't think it necessarily like elevates the medium. I just think it does it very, very well. Because mm. um, I don't think, like... I don't think it necessarily does too much new. Because there's been character switches in games before, like Metal Gear 2, and um, Halo Two, and there's two lots of twos, but um, but like I think I think it's probably maybe the best like example of it. Mm. I wouldn't say it necessarily elevates, but I think it's a very I think it's a very. I great... think, but I think for me, I don't remember another experience where like I've had such in-depth conversations about character motivations and um, uh, and symbolism and like uh, hidden meanings and things about a video game before. Right. Yeah. I can't remember another time when I've had that at a video game. It, it feels like there's so much here to talk about. Um, I feel like Red Dead 2 is on a, on a similar level because there's quite a lot of symbolism. and It's a different type of epic where it's a narrative that could only be told over like 60 hours or so. But um, I, 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 don't, I don't necessarily buy into the idea that this is, you know, high art. I think it's an exceptional video game. But yeah. it's... Um, 
I, I, I do actually, I do agree with the idea that I've never had this much. I don't remember the last time I've sobbed at a video game. I don't think I've ever sobbed like I sobbed with this. And I don't remember any time where I felt grief like this. I mean, I felt it for uh, in Red Dead 2. But I, I, the, I think the ending of this game makes Joel's death suddenly just hit for me. It, it, the whole game through, you're like, he's still sort of present because he's in flashbacks. And then when the ending hit, I was like, oh, he's dead. And I've just sort of had this pit in my stomach and this grief with that. Um, which I hate about the game, but I also love it. I think I just hate the like. Is Carl like gone? Carl, <laughs> <laughs> Carl I dropped out. Carl is out of the game. Um, I'll just uh, I'll message him to come back. Yeah. <laughs> Good uh, boy. I, I think I saw his screen froze for like half a minute. So I think maybe his internet dropped out. Possibly. Hopefully he'll come back. Um, he he's coming back. Oh, there he is. There he is. Hello, Carlo. There you are. There you are. My internet's being terrible. I'm sorry, guys. That's all right. We're ne okay. we're nearly done. We're just making our final points. Um, but yeah, I don't think I've had I've I've ever felt this way about a game before. I don't think it's my favorite game of all time. I just think that it stands alone in in terms of how much substance is there. Yeah, I don't know. It's definitely not like I think it's like one of the best stories I've played in the game. But like, yeah, I don't know. I mean, like in terms of stuff I've played recently, I think I kind of preferred like Deadly Premonition. <laughs> like, <almost>. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think those are those are your those are your personal tastes. Yeah, I that's complete, like, like, I completely understand that. Yeah, yeah. But I think I think that's just because that's like so specific. Yeah, but um, but no, I. But like as like a narrative, I think I think like I think it's definitely one of the best. Yeah, I've played in the video game. I think it's just funny people say that this game has bad writing because they disagree with the direction of the story. Yeah, because I think that is one of the strongest elements of this me. game. Yeah. <laughs> I thought you were going to say something more, Carl. Hello. Hello. Hey. Hi, I'm sorry guys, my internet is not liking you towards can the you end. Can you hear us? You've both frozen on a brilliant position, I don't know if you can still hear me. but <laughs> I can hear you. I can hear you. I can hear you, can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Okay, good. Were you going to say something? Because you were saying about, I was uh, saying about, people were saying it had bad writing. Oh, it just annoys me. It just annoys me that people aren't giving this story the chance. Uh, and it, 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 the story is commenting on the very thing that they are doing. Like, uh, that, that feeling that I had Mind at the very hatred. beginning... Yeah, the, the feeling that I had at the very beginning of, of playing Abby is exactly how they feel towards this story. And by not playing it, they, don't, they, they, they admit defeat to that point, I think. Hmm. It's, it, it annoys me. It frustrates me that people don't... It's a story, for God's sake. Just play it. Just play it, people. <laughs> Just play it. It's, it's not real. Joel ain't real. I mean, he feels real, but he, he, just give it a go. I think, I, think, I think another point was that I, I just don't know how many people like to be challenged by media. This, this is also the thing. I think this game is quite a challenging one in terms of how you view the world and your perspective. And it, it, for, for the average gamer, I'm, I'm not slating average gamers. I'm sure you're great people. But... Uh, mm -hmm. For, for, what, okay. <laughs> <They're racist. laughs> like, if, if I'm playing Call of Duty, I don't want to be challenged. If I start playing The Last of Us because I'm thinking it's Call of Duty, I don't necessarily want that either. So I, I, I kind of get it from that perspective. And, and I feel like if you didn't necessarily understand the ending of the first game, you might just think this doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Good time, no alcohol required. It's a good time now. It's a bad time now. I've got to record. If you are drunk, it's going to be even worse. Yeah. Um, my final point is a uh, well, final couple of points is a uh, should slash do you think there ever will be a Last of Us Part Three? Mm, I mean, I think there might there might be, but I don't think it'll be Neil Druckmann doing it. I don't think they should necessarily do it. Hmm. I missed the question. 
Can you say that? Sorry, I said, do do you think slash should there be a Last of Us Part Three? No. There we go. I think I I think if they were to do the Last of Us Part Three, I I I fully trust them in saying that the like if they want to tell that story and they it's a story that needs to be told, they'll do it. But I I. I personally don't see any way that they could flesh out this story more um, in an interesting and meaningful way. Yes. It's interesting though, because I said the exact same thing when Last of Us Part 1 came out. Right. Because I was like, I don't want... Interesting. There's, there's nothing more to be seen. Then The ending is perfect. I don't want to see any more. And then I was wrong. <laughs> I, I always thought at, the, at that ending, I was like, no, this has such repercussions for the world. That I, I, I don't think that's the end. I don't know what I don't know what it is, but I I, I, I always thought it was going to be some form. I, yeah, I just don't really know where they take it. I think to make it another Ellie and Abby story would feel a bit cheap. I agree. Yeah. If, they were to, if they were to do it, they'd have to do like an Abby only sort of thing, or go back in time, do it like a prequel. Or it would be like about JJ the baby in like twenty years, but then it's like, what would that story even be? Yeah, what's the point? Um. Look, I, I agree. I think, I mean, if it isn't, is the same team working on it and it does come out in the next 10 years and they do make a part three, I would trust that there was a reason to do it. Uh, Neil Druckmann recently sent an interview that uh, he was talking about, you know, when you get to the end of development, you start thinking about what's next. And, um, you know, I'm not sure at the moment whether we'll start working on part three or a new IP or what. I'm hoping it's a new IP. And... Uh, I mean, it's just interesting that in an interview he said, I'm not sure whether we'll make part three next. Yeah. Because it just sounds like he might not feel like he's done with the story or it's either that or it's been badly interpreted. But like him saying next implies that he even thinks there might be a part three later down the line. So I don't know. I like like Carly said. I would trust them to make if it was Neil Druckmann still. I would trust them to make a part three, but I also like the idea that we have these two games and one DLC pack, and in future a multiplayer mode, and that is it. And it's pure quality, sort of genre like generation defining experiences, and that's it. We only got two, because um, I'm sure whatever Naughty Dog make next is going to be excellent. But like, I really hope it's just something more light. I think I think their style could work quite well in like a Western video game or a like sci-fi video game is something I'd be interested in seeing. Oh, like, oh I'd love that. I'd love they, a good sci-fi video. They've game. dropped hints at sci-fi stuff with like having Savage Starlight and like collectible superhero cards. Lots of in like possibly. But yeah, it, it, I think I think like I can imagine just like that uncharted like polish action sequences and like that sense of humor on like um, space battles and like jumping between spaceships and sh- do you know what I mean? Like I can see that. Yeah. Um, but bro, if, if in three years they announce they make a Last of Us Part Three, I'm not sure how I'm gonna feel. Yeah. No, I mean I'd rather they just did like Jack and Daxter Four. <laughs> yeah. That could be pretty I, neat. <laughs> I really, I really, I, I just don't know. There's no option here that I'm actually that interested in now, because I don't want to see Ellie when she's forty. I, d- I don't need to see that. I don't need to see Ellie and Abby anymore. Yeah. I don't. I d- also don't need to see Tommy and Joel back in the day. I just don't. It's done for me. But um. But yeah, uh, I think a sci-fi thing could be interesting. Yeah. I think. I think to wrap up my thoughts on the game, I don't think it's perfect. I agree with Harry, um, and I think it has some sagging points. And like whilst when I was playing it, I just didn't care because I loved it. I was loving it so much. I think if you wanted to make a more precise product, you could do it. But what we have here is such an exceptional piece of game. Um, and like when it comes to people giving ratings of 10 out of 10s and stuff, I don't think any game is perfect. But in terms of value for money, for the experience you get here and the quality of what you're paying for, it is the highest echelon of video games. In terms of production values, for sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I mean, in terms of narrative as well, as you said, it's it's a There's fantastic a lot going narrative. On. Yeah. Um, not necessarily in terms of content. One <laughs> of my biggest things is I wish there was more to unlock in the extras menu. 
I, yeah, I, I, was kind of, I was kind of wish there was like an arcade mode. Yeah. I think that could like, be really fun. <laughs> I think I think a horde mode could be awesome. Yeah. But yeah, we'll see how they get on with it. They've said there's no plans for DLC with this game. All right. Um, with story DLC, but we'll see how they uh, do it. Carly, Harrison, we have been on this call for a long ass like, time. It's like three hours, right? But I, I did, it, went, it went by quite quickly for me. Yeah, I really need to pee. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you both for being here. It's okay, it's a be, pleasure. This, is, this has been a really good episode. We have, we have waited seven years for this game, and you know what? Might as well rip it apart. I'd, in our I'd do it all yeah. again. <laughs> yes. In case you want. Yeah. <laughs> I'll speak to you very soon. Hopefully, yeah. there'll be a new episode soon. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.